chair recognize Mr. Perry for five minutes. Thank the chairman. I thank the witnesses. It's been a long day. Mr. Roth, going back to your statement, Mr. Edwards talked about, um, I want to just kind of revisit that a little bit where it was communicated to you, at least per your statement by the FBI, that there was expected hack and dump or hack and leak operations and that they would occur uh, before the election and, and that these and at the bottom here, the meetings that were rumored and those meetings were rumored that the hack and leak operation would, inv would involve Hunter Biden. Subsequent to that, well, first of all, who told you that? Was that, did you get that? Can you tell, can you tell us where you got that information, if you know? The subject of the possible hack and leak was raised by a number of representatives of the FBI. Was one of them Mr. Chan? Elvis Sir, Chan? Yes, Mr. Okay. Chan was a part of so it. So are you familiar with the fact that in his testimony in, in November of 2022 that he says we did not see any similar competing intrusions to what happened in 2016? And of course, you had been talking to intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies for some time, and they were referring to the 2016 hack and dump operation. Are you familiar that he said that subsequent to you saying this? That they didn't have any evidence? I was not aware of okay. Mr. That's fair. deposition. That's fair. No. Did, did they ever give you any evidence of the hack and dump operation that happened in 2016? And what I think I'm referring to is the allegation that the Clinton campaign, uh, the DNC server was hacked and that that information was spread about, about through WikiLeaks or other information channels. Did they ever give you any evidence of that occurrence during these discussions? That information was made public by the intelligence community in the Mueller report and by the Senate intelligence. Yeah, community. evidence. Did they ever give you evidence? Because I still, as far as we know, CrowdStrike looked at the servers. Did the FBI ever look at the servers? from the DNC, to, you, to your knowledge? I think that would be a question better directed at the Fair FBI. enough, but the point is you, you never saw any evidence, right? You're just taking it on, and, and I'm not blaming you, because a lot of people want to believe the FBI. I've always wanted to believe the FBI. The question is, did they ever give you any evidence to believe that? Because they're making the case. They're making the case that there's a hack and leak operation coming, and it's going to be about Hunter Biden right before the election. Did they ever give you any evidence? It didn't come up. There okay, was yeah, I, I didn't figure it did. And then you all set up a, a secret channel to, to between Twitter and the FBI. Who, who did that from the FBI? Was that Roth? Or, uh, you're Roth. Was that Elvis? I'm sorry. Mr. Chan was a Mr. part of that work, yes. Yes, he was part of that. And that, so you set up, and you actually set up a war room as well, right? I believe the FBI operated a war okay, room. Okay, fair enough. I and didn't And you participated it. in that? As, no, sir, I did you not. You did not. Did Twitter participate in it? I believe Twitter may have sent okay. a representative. Okay, fair enough. And then, and then you did this table talk exercise about Hunter Biden and about a leak about Hunter Biden that would come out right before the election, essentially 10 days, and that happened in September right before the election. And, and you participated in that, right? Yes, I did. Who facilitated that exercise? I know the Aspen Institute, but who facilitated the exercise proper? What, was, was anybody from a government agency facilitating any part of that? Were they involved in the discussions during the exercise? No, I don't believe so, no. So they were just spectators? I wasn't aware that they were spectators either, but I don't recall exactly who was there. I know you don't recall who was there, but who, then who facilitated it? Do you recall that? My recollection is that the event was facilitated by Garrett Graff, who was a member of the Aspen Institute and Aspen Digital. All right. Do you find it odd now, after the fact, and I know you've already testified here that you don't see, to Mr. Sessions, that you didn't see that you were misled or potentially duped. It sure seems highly coincidental. Would you agree? It at least seems highly coincidental. Knowing that the FBI had the laptop, that the FBI set up the war room and the channel and told you, per your statement, that this was going to happen, do you find it highly coincidental that it actually happened and it was Hunter Biden at all? I want to be clear that my statement to the FEC does not suggest that the FBI told me it would involve Hunter Biden. That's a popular reading of that declaration, but it was not my intent. 
I think there is a coincidence there, and I, I really can't speak as to how that came about. Yeah, it's really coincidental. One last question. Did the CIA or the other, other governmental agency ever ask Twitter to look at something that violated Twitter's policy? I don't recall specific outreach by the CIA specifically. Other government agency is what it was called in the Twitter files. Yes, Twitter regularly received reports from government requesting review under our rules. So uh, the, one, the other government agency, that one, did they ever request information regarding violations of Twitter's policies? The CIA. Gentlemen, time's expired, but please answer the question. I thank the Chair. Again, I don't recall specific contact from the CIA, no. Chair recognize Mr. Burla's investigation begins with the story of how big tech, the media, former intelligence agents, and the Bidens themselves suppressed the story of Hunter Biden's laptop weeks before the 2020 election. Today, we're hearing from Twitter executives who buried the New York Post laptop story, claiming it violated the platform's hacked materials policy. In reality, the Twitter executives were hostile towards conservatives and biased towards anyone who opposed their points of view. For example, Mr. Roth, did you write this tweet? I regret the language that I used in some of my former tweets, but yes, I did post that. And I'll read the tweet so it's in the record. Yes, that person in the pink hat is clearly a bigger threat to your brand of feminism than actual Nazis in the White House. Mr. Roth, do you think all conservatives are Nazis? Certainly not, sir. What about the hundreds of people who worked in the Trump administration? Certainly not. Did Ms. Gaddy or any other lawyer at Twitter ever tell you to take down that tweet? No, Twitter did not have a practice of restricting employees sharing their personal viewpoints on the service. Okay. Turning back to the laptop, Ms. Gaddy, are you aware that Hunter Biden's lawyers as recently as last week wrote the Department of Justice about Hunter Biden's laptop? I've seen some articles about that. Yes, yes they did. And it appears that Hunter Biden's attorney is admitting that the laptop and emails on it are authentic. So, Ms. Gaddy, on October 14, 2020, did Hunter Biden report to Twitter that he was the victim of a hack? No, I don't believe he did. Ms. Gaddy, when the New York Post initially broke the story about the laptop, did you call Hunter Biden's lawyer to ask if it was authentic? No, I did not. Isn't it correct that the Biden campaign had contact with Twitter in the run-up to the 2020 election? Not to my knowledge. And you're telling this committee that, that you didn't ask any Biden representative if the laptop was real or for Hunter Biden's attorney's phone number to confirm its authenticity? We did not speak to anybody related to that. Mr. Baker, are you aware that the FBI had Hunter Biden's laptop since December of 2019? I'm sorry, am I aware of that now? I, well, were you aware then? At th then, no. I don't believe, sir, that uh, to the best of my recollection, I don't think I knew But that. you're aware now. I've heard that now, yes. Mr. Becker, did you call any of your contacts at the FBI to ask whether or not they knew if the material had been hacked? I don't recall contacting them about that on that day. M Mr. Roth, Ms. Gaddy, and Mr. Becker. It appears to me that you, you failed at your jobs. You were entrusted with the highest level of power at Twitter, but when you were faced with the New York Post story, instead of allowing people to judge the information for themselves, you rushed to find a reason why the American people shouldn't see it. In a matter of hours, you were deciding on the truth of a story that spans years and dozens of complex international transactions. You did this because you were terrified of Joe Biden not winning the election in, in 2020. That's what it appeared. I can assure you this committee will succeed in holding the Bidens accountable. So much of the evidence of wrongdoing from this family is located in that hard drive that you all led the American people to believe was Russian disinformation when in fact it was not. Now, I agree with Mr. Baker's opening statement. The, the, the concern for me is the level of involvement the FBI had with not just Twitter, but all of our social media platform companies. And I think it kind of goes in the opposite direction of where my, my friend, the ranking member, was, was trying to take this in his opening statement. This is something this committee should be concerned about. The government doesn't have any role 
in suppressing speech. And that's something the media should be very concerned about. What if there's a conservative president that somehow cleans out our FBI and they put in conservatives to suppress liberal speech? We don't, that's something that, that should never happen. So I look forward to more questions. And at this time, I, I yield. Well, you abuse the power of a large corporation, big tech, to censor Americans. And you want to know something? Guess what? I'm so glad that you're censored down. I'm so glad you've lost your jobs. Thank God Elon, Elon Musk bought Twitter. And you know what? Let's talk about something a little bit further. It's amazing to me, Mr. Roth, as the head and trust of safety at Twitter, your ability, or should I say inability, to remove child porn. Now, here's something that disgusts me about you. In your doctoral dissertation entitled Gay Data, you argued that minors should have access to Grindr, an adult male gay hookup app. Minors? Really? You know, Elon Musk took over Twitter and he banned 44,000 accounts that were promoting child porn. You permanently banned my Twitter account, but you allowed child, child porn all over Twitter. Twitter had become a platform, you said, connecting queer young adults. You also wrote on Twitter in 2010, can high school students ever meaningfully consent to sex with their teachers? In 2021, while you were the director of trust and safety on Twitter, an underage boy and his mother announced a lawsuit against Twitter because, because Twitter was benefiting from and refused to remove a lewd video featuring this boy and another minor. That is repulsive. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Chair recognizes Ms. Luna for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Roth, Mr. Roth, um, have you communicated with government officials ever on a platform called JIRA? Yes or no? Real quick answer, we're on the clock. Not yes to no? the best of my recollection. Not no. to your recollection? Great. Have, if you did, in the event communicate, who would have had access to this platform? That's the nature of my confusion. Okay. Jira Did you ever speak to government officials on Jira regarding taking down social media posts? Again, not to the best of my recollection. Can you explain to me why the federal government would ever have interest in communicating through Jira, mind you, a private cloud server with social media companies without oversight to censor American voices. I want to let you know that this is a violation of the First Amendment, and the federal government is colluding with social media companies to censor Americans. Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent to submit these graphics into record. And Mr. Roth, I'm going to refresh your memory for you. This flow chart without objection behind ordered. Thank you, Chair. Um, this flowchart shows the following federal agencies, social media companies, Twitter, leftist nonprofits, and organizations communicating regarding their version of misinformation using JIRA, a private cloud server. On this chart, I want to annotate that the Department of Homeland Security, which has the following branches, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA, count, um, Countering Foreign Intelligence Task Force, now known as the Misinfo, Disinfo, and Malinformation, MDM. This was, again, used against the American people. The Election Partnership Institute, or Election Integrity Partnership, EIP, which includes the following Stanford Internet Observatory, University of Washington Center for Informed Public, Graphica, and Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab, and potentially, according to what we found on the final report by EIP, the DNC. The Center for Internet Security, CIS, a nonprofit funded by DHS, the National Association of Secretaries of State, also known as NASS, and the National Association of State Election Directors, NASED. And in this case, because there are other social media companies involved, Twitter. What do all of these groups, though, have in common? And I'm going to, again, refresh your memory. They were all communicating on a private cloud server known as JIRA. Now, the screenshot behind, uh, screenshot behind me, which is an example of one of thousands, shows on November 3rd, 2020, that you, Mr. Roth, a Twitter employee, were exchanging communications on JIRA, a private cloud server, with CISA, NASS, NAS. NASED and Alex Stamos, who now works at Stanford and is a former security of um, 
a security officer at Facebook to remove a posting. Do you now remember communicating on a private cloud server to remove a posting? Yes or no? I wouldn't agree with the characterization. I don't care if you agree. This, Do you, this, is, this is your stuff. Yes or no, did you communicate with a private entity, the government agency, on a private cloud server, yes or no? The question was if I communicated. Yes or no. Yeah, I'm on time. Yes or no? Ma'am, I don't believe I can give you a yes or no. Well, I'm going to tell question. you right now that you did, and we have proof of it. This, ladies and gentlemen, is joint action between the federal government and a private company to censor and violate the First Amendment. This is also known, and I'm so glad that there's many attorneys on this panel, joint state actors. It's highly illegal. You are all engaged in this action, and I want you to know that you will be all held accountable. Ms. Gaddy, are you still on CISA's Cybersecurity Advisory Council? Yes or no? Yes, I am. Okay. For those who have said that this is a pointless hearing, and I just want to let you guys all know, we found that Twitter was indeed communicating with the federal government to censor Americans. I'd like to remind you that this was all in place before January 6th. So to, so to say that these mechanisms weren't in place and to make it about January 6th, I want to let you know that you guys were actually in control of all of the content, and clearly we have proof of that. Now, if you don't think that this is important to your constituents and the American people from those saying that this was a pointless hearing, I suggest you find other jobs. Chairman, I yield my time. The Twitter files reveal the unrestricted power and censorship regularly exercised by the three witnesses in front of us today, Mr. Roth, Ms. Gaddy, and Mr. Baker. Now, Ms. Navaroli, in your opening, you stated that too few people and companies have too much power. Well, I think you're right. The witnesses here today, they had too much power at Twitter, and they tried to play the role of God as they interfered with the natural right of the people to a free and fair election. Twitter knowingly suspended the New York Post's account, one of the most reliable conservative voices in the country, in fear that an honest story would swing the most divisive election in American history into the hands of their enemy, former President Donald Trump. Now, Mr. Roth, you were part of the secretive SIPPES censorship team at Twitter, correct? No, sir, I'm not sure what that refers to. Mr. Roth, the Twitter files revealed that you rarely adhered to company policy in making your censorship decisions. One reporter from the Twitter files called your group a, quote, high-speed Supreme Court of moderation issuing content rulings on the fly, often in minutes, based on guesses, gut calls, and even Google searches in cases even involving the president. Do you recall making decisions in this manner? No, I do not. Can you explain the process for these quick decisions? Thank you for the question. I think the core of content moderation, whether it's fast or slow, begins with a written set of rules and policies, and that was the primary responsibility of my group at Twitter. It wasn't about making a one-off decision in the moment. It was about having a written and codified set of well, laws for the platform that we followed in each instance. In the vast majority of cases, content moderation decisions were not made by me or by another executive or even by a member of my direct team. They were made by hundreds of content moderators enforcing those rules again and again and again. The situations in which decisions would be escalated to senior executives were few and far between and largely related to the really hard gray area calls. So Mr. Roth, as part of the quote, Supreme Court of moderation at Twitter, did you have the final call over political censorship decisions? No, sir, I did not. Then who had the final call on these decisions? There was a team of people, some of whom represented on this panel today, others not, who were involved in trying to make these decisions, but a portrayal that any one person held sort of supreme or ultimate authority over these decisions would misrepresent what the process was. So your team labeled high profile accounts as VITs, standing for very important tweeters. What was the threshold for being labeled as a VIT? That's an excellent question for which there is not a consistent answer. I don't think Twitter was particularly well put together on that definition. So was the New York Post labeled a VIT? I believe the New York Post's account is verified, and verification conferred some of that status of being a VIT, but 
again, the, the definitions here are a little squishy. Now, is it true that the Twitter comms director, Trenton Kennedy, said in regard to the Post story, I'm struggling to understand the policy basis for marking this unsafe? Yes, it's my understanding that Mr. Kennedy said that. Was the New York Post story regarding Hunter Biden's laptop marked unsafe regardless of uncertainty? It is true that Twitter marked links to that story as unsafe in a number of our systems, which resulted in restricting people's ability to tweet it. That was the decision that Twitter reversed 24 hours later. Well, it's clear from this panel that too few people had too much power. The New York Post Twitter account was suspended in an attempt by Democrats and big tech to go ahead and play God and interfere in a natural, free, and fair election in the free flow of information in this country. The censorship is unbounded. The New York Post has been a reliable source for decades, including their coverage of the nursing home scandals in New York during the pandemic. Now that you and many others are gone from the company, there is hope that this platform will once again be a place where voices can be heard and respected and it can return to be a town hall for all points of view, no matter if you agree with them or not, sir, and that our elections will never again be controlled by big tech. I yield back. Tell me, yo, with your five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Matt Taibbi, a respected reporter who published much of the Twitter files, said, quote, Twitter's contact with FBI was constant and pervasive, as if it were a subsidiary. Now, I want to better understand why he would suggest that. Mr. Roth, while at Twitter, how many meetings did you have with the FBI? I couldn't say for sure, but I More would than say 10? That's a reasonable More than 20? estimate. I couldn't say for sure. More than 50? That seems a bit high. Many meetings with the FBI. Well, we know, uh, uh, how many FBI agents worked at Twitter while you were there? I don't believe any active FBI Former agents. Former FBI agents, how many worked there while you were there? I'm aware of perhaps two. Well, we know of at least nine, um, because they started the BU group chat, BU for Bureau. Now, Mr. Roth, did the FBI ever ask you to share information like users' communication data without going through proper legal channels? No, they did not, and I would have refused if they had. Um, that's correct. I see that you denied Agent Chan's request for access to Twitter's data feed. What's sick isn't that you would deny it. Uh, it's that the FBI would even ask you for the private data of American citizens without going through legal channels of the law. Now, I want to remind you, Mr. Roth, that you are under oath. Did the FBI ever ask you to do anything that was illegal or questionably legal? I'm not a lawyer, but certainly not to the best of my recollection or knowledge. Now, from the hearing that I've been a part of today, um, it's almost impossible to tell where the FBI ends and where Twitter begins. We have Mr. Baker here, a former FBI agent, and there seems to be a revolving door between the FBI and Twitter itself. Um, even Mr. Baker said that there was no collusion with the federal government and Twitter. But Mr. Baker, that's you. You are the collusion between the federal government and the FBI. And now with it, this is such a problem because we're seeing censorship all over. Mr. Roth, Ms. Gaddy, did either of you approve the shadow banning of my account at Lauren Boebert? Yes or no? No, I did not. Not to the best of my recollection. Well, let me refresh your memory because on March 12, 2021, and Mr. Roth, I know you looked at it because Fascist Twitter 1.0 had a public interest exceptions policy, which means for members of Congress to be shadow banned, it had to go before you, Mr. Roth. So I'll ask again, did you shadow ban my account? Yes or no? Again, not to the best of my recollection. So the answer is, Mr. Roth, yes, you did. I found out last night from Twitter staff that you suppressed my account for this tweet. It's a freaking joke about Hillary Clinton being angry that she couldn't rig her election. It's a joke, but in response, being the sinister overlords that you all are, you placed a 90-day account filter so I could not be found. And now we see here that Twitter staff said the visibility filter on my account excluded me from top searches, prevented notifications for non-followers, and much more. This is considered an aggressive visibility filter. You silenced members of Congress from communicating 
with their constituents. You, could, you silenced me from communicating with the American people over a freaking joke. Now, who the hell do you think that you are? Election interference? Yeah, I would say that that was taking place because of you four sitting here. The Hunter Biden laptop story was suppressed. A sitting member of Congress was suppressed. A, a sitting president was banned from Twitter. You know, I bet that Putin is sitting in the Kremlin wishing he had as much election intervention interference as you four here today. We've heard about threats to democracy. Well, what about shutting down a duly elected member of Congress? This is fundamental to our nation's governance, and you all attacked that very foundation. 230 protections? Well, those are for publishers, not for editors. And it's clear you were not acting as publishers, you were acting as editors. And Mr. Chairman, I think it's far past time that we remove 230 protections for, for big tech platforms who are abusing this protection. And let me just say, I'm not angry for myself. I'm not angry because I was silenced. I can reach out to Elon and to his staff and I can see what's happened. And I can sit here today and hold you all in account. I am angry for the millions of Americans who were silenced because of your decisions, because of your actions, because of your collusion with the federal government. They can't reach out to Elon. They can't sit here today and hold you into account we don't know where the FBI ends and Twitter begins. Free speech and even Twitter. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Uh, the lady yields, uh, went over 24 seconds. I'll give Ms. Porter 24 extra seconds for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, real quick, Mr. Roth, um, you've stated already that uh, what happened with the, the New York Post story was similar to the hack and leak scenarios from 2016. You also said that you you actually were opposed to deleting the New York Post uh, story. Uh, who advocated for the removal of the New York Post story? The company's decision to treat it as a violation. Mr. Roth, who at the company actually went over your recommendation? Because you're pretty high up. Who overrode you? The decision was communicated to me by my direct supervisor. Who was that person? Her name was Del Harvey. She okay. was the vice president of trust and safety at the time. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Gaddy, real quick, you said uh, to the chairman earlier, and, and, and I wanna paraphrase what I heard earlier, is that Twitter had no contact with anybody from the Biden team. Is that correct to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Put that up for me. Okay, over my right shoulder, we have an email. Reference, this is, like, this is Saturday, October 24th, uh, 5.39 p.m., referencing five different tweets this is at, at, with a Twitter email chain. Under the line, it's more to review from the Biden team. Does anybody have a comment on how much interaction was happening with the Biden team at Twitter with respect to tweets that they wanted Twitter to review? Ms. Gaddy, Mr. Roth? I'm not familiar with this email. So you're not familiar with this email, Mr. Roth? Are you familiar with this email? Only from what's been reported in the Twitter files. Had you, did you ever have contact with anybody from the Biden team? No, sir, I did not. We explicitly separated the teams that would interact with campaigns from teams like mine that were responsible for content marketing. How big was the organization in Twitter that was actually working with campaigns? I couldn't say for sure. Did you ever have any contact with the DNC? Directly? No, I did not. Did anybody at Twitter have any contact with anybody at the DNC? I think it's likely that somebody at Twitter did, yes. In these, in these emails, it's listed that these are, think, these are tweets that had to be flagged from the Biden team. That's what's in the files. Um, you have no idea how many people actually interfe in, uh, engaged with the Twitter team or how frequently that engagement happened. No, and again, that was by design. We kept those functions separate from content moderation so that we could impartially assess reports like this. Do you know how many tweets were actually flagged and taken down at the behest of the Biden team? I wouldn't agree with the characterization of it as being at the behest of them. These tweets were reported and Twitter independently evaluated them under its but the, rules. But the, but the email is very clear. More to review from Biden team. The response three hours later at the bottom, hold this up real quick so we can see. The request at the bottom, it says, handled these. What does handled these mean? My understanding is that these tweets contained non-consensual nude photos of Hunter Biden 
and they were removed by the company under. Hold on, real quick, Mr. Roth. How could you know so much about the content of these tweets? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, these are just web addresses. I don't know what's in these tweets. You have these things committed to memory that you know the content, but you don't know who you talk to, you talk to at the Biden team? Sir, I didn't meet with the Biden team, but there was extensive public reporting about these tweets specifically that uncovered what they you were. You know the contents of the tweets. I, it was obviously at Twitter, but you have no idea how often people who worked in your organization had with the Biden team during the end of the 2020 presidential elections. I would emphasize that the people who interfaced with the campaigns were not part of my team or organization. I would know what the interactions were if they were on my team. It was a different part of the organization, not mine. Let me ask you a separate question, and I'll ask it of, of you too, Mr. Baker. Have you guys been able to quantify the amount of in-kind contributions associated with taking down the New York Post story? Because the New York Post story was down for two weeks, give or take. Do you have, do you have any uh, understanding of how, how much that story was limited by Twitter and also by other social media companies? What the impact of an in-kind contribution that would be to the Joe Biden presidential election in 2020? I don't know the answer to that question, sir. Do you think it's big? I don't know the Do answer. Do you think it's more than a maximum contribution to a campaign? I don't. I wouldn't want to speculate. Would you call it 25,000? I don't know the answer to that question. 100,000? Sir, I don't know the answer to the question. A million? I don't know the answer to the question. Do you think Twitter would be in violation of uh, federal election laws with the size of an in-kind contribution to take down a story, which is true, by the way? because you guys thought you knew something with limited information? I'm not going to speculate on that uh, sitting here today, sir. I try to, give a, or try to propound a legal analysis of uh, election laws. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair Recky, Mr. Gomez. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Roth, uh, please explain to us why Ms. Uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene or the representative from Georgia was removed from Twitter. Thank you for the question, Congressman. My recollection is that her personal account was banned from Twitter after repeated written notices due to repeated violations of the Twitter rules. Can you add a little specificity to the violation of the Twitter rules? Yes. Again, I didn't have access to my Twitter email, documents, anything that would have let me prepare to answer that in more detail. But my recollection is that the Congresswoman repeatedly violated Twitter's policies about sharing misinformation about COVID-19. She received multiple written warnings about that conduct. She received multiple timeouts related to that conduct. And then ultimately, consistent with the written and published policy, those repeated violations resulted in her account being permanently suspended. So uh, Mr. It, Chairman, so in essence, I'd like to take a point uh, of personal privilege. Uh, the, it's still my time. We'll stop. We'll stop. It's still my clock. It's still my order, time, Mr. Chairman. Um, the order of order why... by Mr. Raskin. Yeah, I, um, I don't believe that members of this committee have the right to interrupt someone's testimony because their Point name was Point of personal mentioned. privilege. And you were mentioning my name, Mr. Raskin. You no, know, I understand, but that's not the rule, Ms. Green. I don't think that, a member. That is the rule in, in Congress. Well, then, then I'd like we a, can I'd, take a point I'd like of the parliamentarian to rule on whether any member of this committee has the right to interrupt a witness's testimony because they mentioned the name of a member of Congress. You mentioned my name, Mr. Raskin. Yeah, I'm not testifying. Chair recognizes Ms. Green. Thank you, Mr. For Chairman. your point of privilege, thank, very thank, briefly. Thank you. Um, uh, for Mr. Roth, who, who made you in charge of what is yeah, true yeah, and what is not I, I, true? I, 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 we'll, uh, Does she get to reopen her no, question? No, okay. that, that we'll, we'll, we'll go back to Mr. Mr. Gomez. Gomez and, and Mr. Gomez, please remember the, the decorum of the committee. Uh, the clock, we'll restart the clock now. We, you didn't lose any time. Chair recognized Mr. Gomez. Thank you so much. Um, the gentle lady from Georgia was suspended from Twitter for, for knowingly and consistently spreading conspiracy theories about COVID-19 vaccine, right, which is shameful, shameful, especially in a pandemic where millions, a uh, million people have lost their lives. Um, with that, I yield my rest of my time to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Gold, uh, Goldman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gomez. Um, let's talk about the so-called Twitter files, uh, which my Republican colleagues seem to think are God's gift to journalism. In one about the Hunter Biden laptop, the author says that every single fact in the New York Post story was accurate. 
And Chairman Comer, I notice you blew up the cover of that New York Post story, which I appreciate you doing that, because I'd like to dig into this article. The very first paragraph says Hunter Biden introduced his father to a top executive at a Ukrainian energy firm less than a year before the elder Biden pressured government officials in Ukraine into firing a prosecutor who was investigating the company. That is false. 100% false. Is the gentleman sure about that? Yes. In fact, I am sure about that. And as the lead counsel in the first impeachment investigation, we proved that he was actually fired because he was not prosecuting corruption, not that he, he was fired because he was prosecuting corruption. Corruption the of fact that the president's I, son's company. I, I, I'm sorry, question. would the gentleman yield corruption of the president's son's company? I'd like to reclaim my time. Gentlemen's recognized. The fact that Joe Biden fired, consistent with U.S. policy in every single European country, the prosecutor general in Ukraine because he did not prosecute corruption, including at companies like Burisma, has been proven over and over and over. And if you want to know who actually prosecuted Burisma, Chairman Comer, you should talk to the British authorities because they were the ones who were prosecuting Burisma, and they couldn't get any cooperation from the Ukrainian prosecutor general. So that's why he was fired. So right off the top, the very first paragraph of this so-called bombshell story is completely false. Now, what, are the, what is the allegation that we are hearing from our Republican colleagues about the connection to Joe Biden and Burisma. It is an email from a Burisma employee thanking Hunter Biden for organizing a meeting with the Vice President Biden. We know nothing about the substance of that meeting. We know nothing about how long they met. It was not on Vice President Biden's schedule. And in fact, I would ask my Republican colleagues, do you meet with foreign businessmen? Do you meet with foreign diplomats? If we were to say to you every single time you met with somebody that you discussed something that you're voting on, how would you react? It's preposterous. And Chairman Comer, you have said in your opening statement that Joe Biden lied to the American people. That is a bold, bold accusation. And so far, we've seen no actual evidence of any lies or any support for Joe Biden being involved in anything having to do with Ukraine other than promoting U.S. former policy. And I hope that you are not abusing the power as chairman of this, of this committee and that you are not wasting taxpayer dollars on a fishing expedition into a civilian child of a president for political purposes. I yield back. The gentleman yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Roth, did the government tell you that the Biden laptop story was fake? No, sir, they did not. Did they tell you it was hacked? No, sir, they did not. On October 14, 2020, Twitter blocks the New York Post story on the Hunter Biden, uh, the, the New York Post story on Hunter Biden and suspends their account. The night before, FBI Special Agent Elvis Chan sends you an email. The email says this, heads up, I will be sending a teleporter link for you to download 10 documents. It's not spam. Please confirm receipt when you get it. Two minutes later, 6.24 p.m., you respond back, received and downloaded, thanks. What were those 10 documents? Twitter didn't give me access to my laptop, but Special Agent Chan has said publicly, and the FBI has confirmed that those documents did not relate to Hunter Biden, and that's my recollection of that. What did they relate to? My interactions with Agent Chan and with the FBI almost entirely focused on what the FBI called malign foreign interference, things like Russian troll farms and Iranian involvement in the elections, not on any type of domestic Any of the activity. information on there classified? No, sir, I do not hold a security clearance, and so I would not have received any classified information. Who does hold a security clearance? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to second email here. I'm just curious about this. Uh, what I propose is that 30 days out from the election, this is, a, this is another email to you from Mr. Chan, 30 days, you get, we get uh, temporary clearances. You pick who they are. Who were the people at Twitter who had a security clearance? 
To be honest, sir, I'm not sure. And we never ultimately followed through on this plan to get temporary clearances. Did anyone at Twitter have a security clearance? It's my understanding that at least some current or former employees did hold clearances, but I wasn't certain about Ms. that. Ms. Gaddy, do you know if anyone took up Mr. Chan's offer to hand out security clearances 30 days before the 2020 election? Not that I'm aware. So we don't know how many people had security clearances. Twitter, do we know? Mr. Baker, Mr. Gaddy, and Ms. Gaddy, anyone know how many people on Twitter had a security clearance in the 30 days prior to the election? I don't know the answer to that question, Ms. sir. Ms. Gaddy? I do not know. Mr. Mr. Roth, you don't know? No, sir. Well, how about the last one? Ms. Navaroli, do you know? No. I mean, yeah. it seemed like the offer was to sort of just hand them out like candy. I just wondered who had them. No one knows? Okay. Uh, did, so the FBI didn't tell you uh, that, the, that it was fake, didn't tell you that it was hacked. Uh, and, and Mr. Roth, did the, did the story violate your policies? In my judgment at the time, no, it did not. Yeah, that's what you said. Said what I would propose, uh, excuse me, is you said it isn't clearly a violation of our hack materials policy, nor is it clearly a violation of anything else. So I think what a lot of people are wondering is if it didn't violate your policies and they didn't tell you it was fake, didn't tell you it was hacked, why'd you take it down? The company made a decision that found that it did violate the policy. It wasn't my personal judgment at the time that it did, but the decision was communicated to me by my direct supervisor, and ultimately, I didn't disagree with it enough to object to you know, you know what action. You know what I think happened, Mr. Roth? I think, I think you guys got played. I think you guys wanted to, wanted to take it deep down. We saw what the chairman put up where you said, you know, everyone in the White House is, an, is a fascist. I think you guys wanted it to t be taken down. I think you meet with these guys every week. We know that's been established in the Twitter files. You had weekly meetings with Mr. Chan in the run-up to the election. They send you all kinds of emails. They send you documents on the super secret James Bond teleporter. You get information on that. I think you guys wanted to take it down. I think you guys got played by the FBI. And that's the scary part. Because we had 50, I mean, the, the, this to me is the real takeaway. 51 former intelligence officials five days after you guys take down the Hunter Biden story and block the New York Post account. Five days later, 51 former Intel officials send a letter and they say, the Hunter Biden story has all the classic earmarks of a Russian information operation. The information operation was run on you guys. And then by extension, run on the American people. And that's the concern. And to Mr. Raskin's point that you guys aren't bound by the First Amendment because you're a private company, okay, maybe so. But your, and your terms of service don't have to comply with the First Amendment. Would that be right, Mr. Roth? They don't have to. You've said that as much in your testimony. My understanding of the First Amendment is that it protects people and businesses from government, not Understand. forms how the what I'm in your terms of service. So here's what I want to know. Here's what I want to know. Is this, is this a violation of the First Amendment when the government, Mr. Chan, again, sending you an email saying, we think these accounts need to be looked at because they violate your terms of service. That's a different standard. So you got the government saying your terms of service, which don't have to comply with the First Amendment, but the government saying we don't think these accounts comply with your terms of service. Please take them down. You see a problem there, Mr. Mr. Roth? Mr. Chairman, I'm seeing a flashing red light. I'm happy to answer the question. Um, do I think that that's a valuable use of the FBI's time? No. But I don't see in a request for review a problem under the First Amendment, no. I sure do. I, I, I thank the gentleman. I get back. Chair recognizes Mr. Connolly for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. We welcome everyone to the second hearing of the Select Committee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. The Chair now recognizes himself for an opening statement. In the run-up to the 2020 presidential election, FBI Special Agent Elvis Chan, in his deposition in Missouri versus Biden, said that he repeatedly, repeatedly informed Twitter and other social media platforms of the likelihood of a hack and leak operation in the run up to that presidential election. He did it even though there was no evidence. In fact, he said in his deposition that we hadn't seen anything, no intrusions, no hack, yet he repeatedly told him something was coming. Joel Roth, head of trust and safety at Twitter, testified that he had had regular meetings with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and other folks regarding election security. During these weekly meetings, federal law enforcement agencies communicated that they expected a hack and leak operation. 
The expectations of a hack and leak operation were discussed throughout 2020, and he was told they would occur in a period shortly before the 2020 presidential election, likely in October. And finally, he said, I also learned in these meetings that there were rumors that a hack and leak operation would involve Hunter Biden. So what did the government tell him? A hack and leak operation was coming. How often did the government tell him this? Repeatedly for a year, when did the government say it was gonna happen? October of 2020, and who did the government say it would involve? Hunter Biden. Now think about it. Government had no evidence of any intrusions, no evidence of a hack and leak, yet for a year they tell Twitter that a hack and leak is coming, it's coming in October, and it will involve Hunter Biden. No evidence, but the FBI knows what's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen, and who it's gonna involve. Now that's amazing. That is amazing to me. Maybe, I mean, maybe they get the time right. We're kind of used to October surprises every four years. So maybe they get the time right, but they got the time, they got the method, and they got the person. That's amazing. It's almost like these guys were clairvoyant. How did they know? How did they know? Maybe it's because they had the laptop and they had had it for a year. They had the laptop, they knew it wasn't hacked, but that's not what they told Twitter. They didn't tell Twitter that information, and Twitter believed, frankly, everything they said. In those weekly meetings, the FBI had built a cozy relationship with this tech company and others as well, we believe. Emails between the FBI and Twitter began with the greeting, hey, Twitter folks. Emails that asked Twitter to take down accounts and limit visibility of tweets. The FBI handed out security clearance to folks at Twitter. They communicated with Twitter on the secret teleporter app where messages disappear after a certain length of time. And of course, they paid Twitter $3.4 million. In addition, on August 6, 2020, the FBI briefed Senators Grassley and Johnson. And according to the Senator's testimony, last month in front of this committee, the briefing was bogus and done so someone could go leak that the briefing had happened and undermine the Senator's investigation. In September of 2020, a government-funded think tank gets involved. They do a tabletop exercise. The participants include the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other mainstream media outlets. Facebook is there. Mr. Roth of Twitter is there. The organizer was the former CEO of NPR and the former head of news at Twitter. The mock exercise is hosted by the Aspen Institute. The Aspen Institute, which, by the way, in 2020, their budget was $9.3 million dollars. $5 million from the State Department, $4 million from USAID, almost all their budget. Guess the title. Guess the title of this exercise, the Aspen Digital Hack and Dump Working Group. And guess who the subject was? Guess who the subject was? Hunter Biden. That's amazing. October 14, 2020, the New York Post runs the story on the Biden laptop and Twitter takes it down, even though it was accurate and even though it didn't violate Twitter's rules of, Twitter's rules. Other social media uh, companies do the same. Mainstream press works to downplay and discredit the story. Finally, as if on cue, five days later on October 19th, 51 former Intel officials sign a letter with the now famous sentence, the Biden laptop story has all the classic earmarks of a Russian information operation. Something that was absolutely false. Our government built a cozy relationship with big tech. They primed him for a hack and leak operation. They funded the think tank, which further primed big tech and big media. They leaked information to undermine the good work of two United States senators. And then 51 former Intel officials closed the deal with their letter. As Mr. Schellenberger pointed out in his reporting, the information op was run on us, run on we the people. And if that's not the weaponiza weaponization of government, I don't know what is. And I really, I'll get to this in a second, but I wanna thank our, our witnesses for being here today. I'll get to this after we allow uh, the ranking member her opening statement. I yield to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today and all of your important work that has, you have put into writing the Twitter files. Uh, thank you for your willingness to come here and be subjected to the kind of abuse that we've observed when all you're trying to do 
is talk about the importance of the First Amendment and why the federal government should not be doing what they did and what has been evidenced in the Twitter files. I often say that sunshine is the best disinfectant. And boy, after listening to you and reading the reports that I have, does our federal government need to be fumigated. Mr. Taibbi, I'd like to focus on Twitter files part nine, Twitter and other government agencies, as I think a lot of the evidence you present in this section touches on the major takeaways that are so important for Americans to understand about the seriousness of what was found in the Twitter files. In your testimony describing the cooperation between the federal government and tech companies like Twitter, you stated, quote, a focus of this growing network is making lists of people whose opinions, beliefs, associations, or sympathies are deemed to be misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation, end quote. What's interesting to me is that what is missing from that list is the word unlawful. That's true, yes. And so it notably seems to be missing from the FBI's lexicon. In part nine of the Twitter files, Mr. Taibbi notes that the main conduit sending requests to Twitter would routinely label these flags as violations of Twitter's terms of service. Even Jim Baker, a Twitter employee at the time and someone who is allegedly a former general counsel of the FBI, stated, quote, but also odd that they are searching for violations of our policies. Mr. Taibbi, what was, about the, what was the approximate percentage of the FBI requests to Twitter being based on the justification it vi that, the tw that the tweet violated the company's terms of service? Uh, Ms. Congressman, I would say that that was a standard disclosure or a standard disclaimer in almost all the communications from the FBI to Twitter. Uh, they would, there would usually be a line in there saying something like, for your consideration, we believe the following 207 accounts may have violated your terms of service. Um, but notably, they, they were, they very rarely focused on words like truth or inaccuracy. Uh, very often they used the words malinformation, misinformation, or disinformation. Uh, and so I think they were trying to shift the focus from one idea to the other. Okay, I think that's interesting as well. What do you make of the finding that the FBI found it its responsibility to police violation of a private company's terms of service as a priority over policing violations of U.S. federal law? We've, there, there were a couple of very telling emails that we, um, we published. Uh, one was by the, uh, a lawyer named Sasha Cardiel, where the company was being so overwhelmed by... Um, by request from the FBI, and in fact, they, they gave each other a sort of digital high five after one batch, saying that was a monumental undertaking to clear all of these. But she noted that, that she believed that, that the FBI was essentially um, creating, doing word searches keyed to Twitter's terms of service, um, looking for violations of terms of service specifically so that they could make recommendations along those lines, which we found interesting. Do you believe it's the FBI's responsibility to police the terms of service for a private company? I do not. I, th I think you cannot have a state-sponsored anti-disinformation effort um, and also without directly striking at the whole concept of free speech. I think the two ideas are in direct conflict. Uh, and this is a fundamental misunderstanding, I think, of a lot of the people who get into this world. Some of them, I believe, in a well-meaning way. I think they, they're actually trying to accomplish something positive. But they don't understand what free speech means and what happens when you do this. It undermines the whole concept um, that truth doesn't come from, uh, isn't mandated, that we arrive at it through debate and discussion. Well, in fact, wouldn't you agree with me that the First Amendment is broader than Twitter's terms of service? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And wouldn't you also agree with me that the FBI is responsible for complying with the First Amendment, not Twitter's terms of service? I would hope so, yes. Yeah. Uh, you also highlighted the presence of people like Jim Baker at Twitter. And again, I've noted that he is allegedly a former FBI employee. Part 9 also speaks of a former, a former other government association employees working at Twitter. What was the extent to which you found former FBI or other intelligence community employees working at Twitter? And did you find it odd? 
Uh, there was a significant quantity of people um, who had come from the intelligence world um, or who had worked at state agencies. In fact, that was a very common method by which um, members of uh, people who are currently working in government would reach out to Twitter. Uh, for instance, we found an email by um, a current State Department official who reached out to a former State Department official asking that 14 uh, ordinary Americans have their accounts deleted. That was in a recent Twitter files um, uh, release. So yes, there's, there's an extraordinary number of these people. A lot of them come from the intelligence world, which we did find unusual, I think. Okay, General, thank you very much, and I yield back. General Lay's time is expired. Uh, I thank her. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. The gentleman uh, from Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Lynch, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do need to correct the record. Uh, so there's been the suggestion here that uh, the FBI and other government agencies uh, pressured employees at Twitter uh, to uh, validate these theories of foreign influence. Uh, when we had Mr. Roth, who was, uh, Yoel Roth, who's the former global head of trust and safety at Twitter, so we asked Twitter uh, if there was uh, pressure applied, and Mr. Roth said, no, I would not agree with that. The FBI, this is his quote, the FBI was quite careful and quite consistent to request review of the accounts, but not to cross the line into advocating for Twitter to take any particular action. So, so that's what Twitter said about the actions of the FBI vis-a-vis uh, -vis Twitter. Uh, Mr. Taibbi, In 2019, uh, Special Counsel Robert Mueller unequivocally found that the Internet Research Agency, owned by Yevgeny Prigozhin, the same oligarch who runs uh, the Wagner Group, carried out an extensive social media dis disinformation campaign to help then-candidate Donald Trump and to hurt Hillary Clinton. He also found that the Russian intelligence interfered with the 2016 election via a hack and release campaign damaging to the Clinton campaign. Uh, these, these particular findings came on the heels of the unanimous assessment on the part of the United States 18 intelligence agencies that Russian President Putin, quote, ordered an influence campaign in 2016 aimed at the presidential election, close quote. They also followed the release of a bipartisan Senate Intelligence Committee report finding that Russia and Vladimir Putin engaged in, I quote, aggressive multifaceted effort to influence the U.S. president election. So, Mr. Taibbi, do you believe, do you believe that the Russians and their oligarch-controlled internet research agency interfered in the 2016 election via this <clears throat> social media disinformation campaign? Do you believe that? Mr. Congressman, my disagreement with the issue well, is... I think this is, a, this is basically a yes or no question. Either you think so or you don't, and I don't have a lot of time, so... Okay, well then I'm, I'm going to answer not in the sense that, you, uh, that you're putting it, Okay. Um, I think okay. all countries all right. engage in you, off offensive in information you, operations. The you, question is scale. Do you believe and, that and the Russia Twitter files are hacking, reclaiming my time? This is how it works now. I'll ask the questions and you try to provide an answer if you can. Um, you have to allow them to answer. Do you sir. believe? The gentleman is out of order and should not be interrupting a member asking a question on our you, side, Mr. Chairman. Reclaiming my time from everyone. Uh, do you believe that Russia engaged in a hack and release campaign damaging to the Clinton campaign uh, back in 2016? Again, uh, just I don't know. And, and I, would, I would say okay. it's irrelevant. Right, let me ask Mr. Schellenbeck. Uh, these are pretty easy questions. That's just whether you believe it or not. Uh, Mr. Schellenbeck, same question. Do you believe that the Russian oligarch-controlled Internet Research Agency interfered in the 2016 election? I think that they tried to. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Mr. Schellenbeck, do you believe that the Russians engaged in a hack and release campaign with respect to the uh, 
damaging information they released uh, regarding the Clinton campaign? To the best of my awareness, that is what happened. Yes. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, That's not so the same thing. The as reason influence. I understand. I understand. Yeah. Also, that material was true. Yeah. I mean, look. Uh, I let me introduce a couple of documents uh, just to reinforce uh, that we've got. Uh, that, is, that is not a legitimate predicate unanimous, for censorship. Unanimous. Reclaiming my time. Sure. Gentleman's out of order. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll ask unanimous consent to enter the indictment in the United States versus the Internet Research Agency, U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, number 118-32, and also ask to enter into the record the executive summary to volume one of the Mueller report, which states, in March 2016, the GRU, uh, began hacking, this is the Russian agency, began hacking the email accounts of the Clinton campaign, volunteers and employees, including campaign chairman John Podesta. The GRU later released additional materials through the organization WikiLeaks. The presidential of campaign of Donald Trump showed interest in WikiLeaks releases of the documents and welcomed their potential damage to without, candidate Clinton. So I've introduced without, these document, documents. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've, I've introduced time. these documents because it's clear that, me, that Russia's use of social media to interfere in the 2016 election created abundant time reason. Is, abundant reason. Okay, we, I think for social media platforms to be concerned. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, uh, without objection, these uh, documents are entered into the record. We now recognize a gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to. Five minutes. Uh, Chairman. Hit that, hit that, hit Matt, uh, Mr. Tybee, hit that. Um, uh. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, members of the Select Committee, thank you for having me today. My name is Matt Taibbi. I've been a reporter for 30 years uh, and a staunch advocate of the First Amendment. Much of that time was spent at Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, Ranking Member Plaskett, um, I'm not a so-called journalist. Uh, I've won the National Magazine Award, the IF Stone Award for Independent Journalism, and I've written 10 books, including four New York Times, New York Times bestsellers. <laughs> uh, I'm now the editor of the online magazine Racket on the independent platform Substack. I'm here today because of a series of events that began late last year when I received a note from a source online. It read, are you interested in doing a deep dive into what censorship and manipulation was going on at Twitter? A week later, the first of what became known as the Twitter files reports came out. To say these attracted intense public in interest would be an understatement. My computer looked like a Vegas slot machine uh, as the, just the first tweet about the blockage of the Hunter Biden laptop story registered 143 million impressions and 30 million engagements. But it wasn't until a week after the first report, after Michael Schellenberger, Barry Weiss, and other researchers joined the search of the files that we started to grasp the significance of this story. The original promise of the internet was that it might democratize the exchange of information globally. A free internet would overwhelm all attempts to control information flow, its very existence a threat to anti-democratic forms of government everywhere. What we found in the files was a sweeping effort to reverse that promise and use machine learning and other tools to turn the internet into an in instrument of censorship and social control. Unfortunately, our own government appears to be playing a lead role. We saw the first hints in communications between Twitter executives before the 2020 election, when we read things like, flagged by DHS, or please see attached report from FBI for potential misinformation. This would be attached to an Excel spreadsheet with a long list of names whose accounts were often suspended shortly after. Uh, again, Ranking Member Plaskett, I would note that the evidence of Twitter government relationship includes lists of tens of thousands of names on both the left and right. The people affected include Trump supporters, but also left-leaning sites like Consortium and Truthout, the leftist South American channel Telesur, the Yellow Vest Movement. That, in fact, is a key point of the Twitter files, that it's neither a left nor right issue. Following the trail of communications between Twitter and the federal government across Tens of thousands of emails led to a series of revelations. Mr. Chairman, we summarized and submitted them to the committee in the form of a new Twitter file thread, which was also released to the public this morning. We learned 
Twitter, Facebook, Google, and other companies developed a formal system for taking in moderation requests from every corner of government, from the FBI, the DHS, the HHS, DOD, the Global Engagement Center at State, even the CIA. For every government agency scanning Twitter, there were perhaps 20 quasi-private entities doing the same thing, including Stanford's Election Integrity Partnership, NewsGuard, the Global Disinformation Index, and many others, many taxpayer-funded. A focus of this fast-growing network, as Mike noted, is making lists of people whose opinions, beliefs, associations, or sympathies are deemed misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation. That last term is just a euphemism for true but inconvenient. Undeniably, the making of such lists is a form of digital McCarthyism. Ordinary Americans are not just being reported to Twitter for deamplification or deplatforming, but the firms like PayPal, digital advertisers like Xander, and crowdfunding sites like GoFundMe. These companies can and do refuse service to law-abiding people and, and businesses whose only crime is falling afoul of a distant, faceless, unaccountable, algorithmic judge. As someone who grew up a traditional ACLU liberal, this mechanism for punishment and deprivation without due process is horrifying. Another troubling aspect is the role of the press, which should be the people's last line of defense in such cases. But instead of investigating these groups, journalists partnered with them. If Twitter declined to remove an account right away, government agencies and NGOs would call reporters for the New York Times, Washington Post, and other outlets, who in turn would call Twitter, demanding to know why action had not yet been taken. Effectively, news media became an arm of a state-sponsored thought policing system. I'm running out of time, so I'll just sum up and say, um, it's just not possible to instantly arrive at truth. It is, it is however, possible becoming uh, technologically uh, possible to instantly define and enforce a political consensus online, which I believe is what we're looking at. This is a grave threat to people of all pers political persuasions. Uh, the First Amendment and American population accustomed to the right to speak is the best defense left against the censorship industrial complex. If the latter can knock over our first and most important constitutional guarantee, these groups will have no serious opponent left anywhere. If there's anything the Twitter files show, it's that we're in danger of losing this most precious right without which all democratic rights are impossible. Thank you for the opportunity to appear, and I'd be happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you. California is recognized, excuse me. I'd like to yield my time to Mr. Goldman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sanchez. Um, Mr. Schellenberger, first, I'd just like to compliment you on your choice of tie today. Um, seems like we were, we're on the same page. Um, I would also just like to respond to your last uh, point and just remind everyone that, of course, we all believe in the First Amendment, but the First Amendment applies to government prohibition of speech, not to private companies. Um, I want to talk about your Twitter files, number seven, Mr. Schellenberger. Uh, are you aware that Rudy Giuliani was the sole source of the hard drive obtained by the New York Post? That is my understanding. And are you aware that Rudy Giuliani had been openly cavorting with agents of Russian intelligence throughout 2020? That is also my understanding. Now, this was the same Russian agent who had been feeding information to Senators uh, Johnson and Grassley I might add. Um, but also, are you aware that Rudy Giuliani told the New York Times that he did not want anyone to do an analysis of the hard drive until it was published? I was not aware of that exactly, but... But you don't dispute it? I don't dispute it. And you're, are you aware um, that one of the New York Post reporters uh, for the Hunt and Bider story refused to put his byline on the story? Yes. And are you aware that Fox News called the story, quote, very sketchy, unquote? I'm aware that somebody at Fox News said that, yes. Correct. Brett Baer at Fox News said yes. that. Yes. Um, and are you aware that the FBI had nothing to do with Twitter's decision to pause the New York Post story? I am not aware of that. Okay. Well, let me read you the testimony from Yoel Roth. Uh, at the hearing we had on February 8th. The FBI, quote, the FBI was quite careful and consistent 
to request review of the accounts, but not to cross the line into advocating for Twitter to take any particular action. And then Jim Baker said, in response to the chairman's question, when he asked, did you talk to the FBI about the Hunter Biden story? He said, to the best of my recollection, I did not talk to the FBI about the Hunter Biden story before that day. In other testimony, Yoel Roth said that the information that he received from the FBI had nothing to do with the Hunter Biden story. Now, are you aware that there was an analysis of the hard drive that was done by the Washington Post at a later date? My awareness is that multiple media organizations have done analyses and found the, including CBS, and found that it was indeed, the laptop was authentic and that nothing had been okay. changed on it. So let's just get something clear. The laptop that the FBI had is different than the hard drive that Rudy Giuliani gave to the New York Post. A hard drive, you agree with this, is a copy uh, from a laptop, right? Yes. And you are aware that hard drives can be altered, are you not? Of course. Okay. So are you aware that the Washington Post analysis of the hard drive showed that it had been altered? I have heard that, but I'm also saying CBS verified. Politico. And other media organizations have verified. I mean, but we're not talking, about, authentic really we're not talking about authenticity. We're not talking about okay. authenticity. We're talking about whether it's been altered. Yeah. Okay. There's no question there's some material on the hard drive that is authentic and accurate. But are you aware that there's some material that is not? My understanding is that there are copies of the hard drive that have been tampered with and that media organizations, including CBS, have verified that, that the, the, la the laptop in question was not tampered with. I don't know what the laptop in question, but let's yeah. move on. Because you said in your Twitter files, am I correct, that every single fact in the New York Post story was accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, do you, do you recall that the first paragraph of that Post story said that then Vice President Joe Biden pressured Ukraine to fire its prosecutor general because he was investigating Burisma where Hunter Biden was on the board? Yes. Okay. I have here, which I'd like to enter into the record, the Trump Ukraine impeachment inquiry report, 300 pages by the House Intelligence Committee. Did you review this report before you said that every fact in this story was accurate? Without objection, the, the, the material be entered in the record. I, 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 did I read that before I wrote the Twitter files? No. Yeah. Okay. I'm aware of its if content. you read this, you would have known that every single State Department and Trump administration expert on Ukraine said that Vice President Joe Biden, in, in uh, concert with the European Union and the IMF, was executing official U.S. policy by encouraging Ukraine to fire the prosecutor general because he was not prosecuting corruption and was not prosecuting companies like Burisma. So that story, notwithstanding your allegations, was false. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, now yield recognize back? The, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from um, uh, Florida, Mr. Gates, for five minutes. Impeachment nostalgia always warms my heart, but we are here focused on a weaponized government, a whole of government approach that has been turned against the American people. And while Rudy Giuliani may have been running around with the laptop in 2020, what is an indisputable fact is that the FBI had the laptop in 2019. And it appears that the last round of questioning misses the boat, that it's true. The information is authentic. The pictures, the videos, the emails, there hasn't been a single allegation that there is a single, do single doctored email. Unlike what we saw before the FISA courts, where the FBI itself was doctoring emails to try to smear President Trump. But I, I have to get to a, a question I'm amazed hasn't been asked of the two of you. This FTC consent decree, where it is government action subject to rigorous scrutiny under First Amendment standards, Government action demanding that your names be listed. How did it feel when you found out that you were being expressly targeted by a government document based on your reporting? It was chilling. I mean, it's disturbing. I, I never thought that would happen in the United States of America, to be perfectly honest. I've been in a bunch, I've lived in a bunch of authoritarian countries, I've visited a lot of authoritarian countries, never thought this kind of thing would be going on here. And the nexus to authoritarianism is the desire to control the nature of truth itself. 
our understandings change about things. We learn new things. We challenge prior assumptions. But if a bunch of people in Washington, D.C. get to decide what the truth is and then enforce it on the country and then punish and target those who report on their conduct, we are drifting more toward that. How did you feel, Mr. Tybee, when you saw your name? I was you know, upset, obviously. Um, I, I lived in uh, Russia during the 90s and early 2000s. I was there when Putin took power. I was friends with a group of uh, very brave, uh, muckraking reporters in, in Russia, many of whom didn't make it. A few of them um, were murdered after Putin came to power. So I've always been conscious of how the risks that other reporters take in other countries are incredibly severe, and that's one of the reasons why I'm motivated to protect the First Amendment, because our, our country has the best protections for reporters in the world. Um, but this kind of thing, where the government is looking for information about reporters, it's usually a canary in the coal mine that something worse is coming in terms of uh, an effort to exercise control over the press. And so on that level, it's, it's absolutely disturbing. Also, the Aspen Institute report that we, we uh, published today, uh, talked about today in the Twitter files thread, um, ex one of their recommendations was that the FTC be empowered uh, to get uh, to have unlimited power to search uh, all data of uh, private companies so that they could more freely and more accurately search uh, the speech of ordinary citizens. So, so as we're trying to put downward pressure on the government's expanding authority to be able to engage in what we see mostly from dictatorships, what you're reporting and what you're observing is that actually they view this as a growth industry the information business, right? This, this yes. censorship industrial uh, complex is a growth industry to the government. I think the key thing also, yes, and the thing to understand is that NSF- new, how, What is NewsGuard and how are they part of the censorship industrial complex? Yeah, and we, by the way, we talked about Richard Stengel. He's on the board of NewsGuard. NewsGuard and the Dif Disinformation Index are both US government funded entities who are working to drive advertiser revenue away from disfavored publications and towards the ones that they favor. This is uh, now, you totally know, What I'm used to in this town is government officials pick their favorite outlets and they give them the best scoops and they give them the best stories and there's a fusion of media and government that has long made me uncomfortable. What, but what you're describing now is literally the directing of revenue to certain media companies over other media companies designed and implemented with U.S. government funding and support. That's right. That, that is an astonishing, if we do not take a look at NewsGuard, we, we have failed. And you talk about the brave reporting that occurs and what it subjects you to. I would suggest there's also political bravery that I have observed. While we've only heard from Democrats on this panel attacking you, discrediting you, a lot like they've tried to attack and discredit FBI whistleblowers who are truth tellers, there are brave Democrats who still believe in free speech, and I would advise my colleagues to look at the comments of Ro Khanna, who has been deeply, deeply concerned about this weaponization of government, and he believes these Twitter files are indeed worthy of our focus and our energy, and that is exactly what we are going to do. I yield back. I, th <clears throat> I think the gentleman would now recognize the gentlelady from uh, New York. I, I, I still have my five minutes, Mr. Chairman. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Uh, I understand why well, you may not Mr. Because Mr., uh, you were yielded five. The gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes. Thank Excuse you. me. Mr. Schellenberger, I may have misheard earlier, but is it your testimony here today that you disagree with the two indictments by Special Counsel Robert Mueller that definitively established that Russia interfered in our 2016 election through social media disinformation and a hack and leak operation? No, I don't disagree. Okay. Mr. Taibbi, do you disagree with those two indictments? Well, and I don't, indictments aren't a thing to disagree Do you disagree, with. there are about 40 or 50 pages. Do you disagree with the evidence outlined in those indictments? Well, uh, indictments are just charges. When, when, when I just the, asked you, do you disagree with the evidence included in those indictments, yes or no? I'm not on the jury of that case. I couldn't possibly say yes or no. Okay, because you said earlier, I believe, that you did not see Russia, you, you could not confirm that Russia interfered in our election in 2016, that you don't believe that. Is that your testimony here today? You don't believe that they did? I think it's possible that they, they may have on a small scale, but certainly not to what's been reported. What's been reported or what's been included in the indictments? 
Well, again, indictments are allegations. They're not proof. And I understand. In, in, it's in, pretty in detailed allegations. In the so Mueller indictment, should, by the way. You should go read the indictment and then come back and tell us if you actually think there's no proof of it. Well, but let me move on. Some, some of those defendants, by please, the way, when please, they showed up. Please, let me move on. That's how this works. You should know that by now. So do you disagree with the special counsel Mueller's conclusion in his report, Mr. Taibbi, that the Trump campaign knew about Russia's interference, they welcomed it, and they used it for their benefit? You have no reason to disagree with that, don't you? You have okay. no information. So after that foreign interference in our 2016 election, Twitter and other social media companies naturally wanted to work with the intelligence community to stop Vladimir Putin from interfering in our elections again. Mr. Taibbi, do you think it's a legitimate pursuit of the FBI to try to stop foreign interference in our elections? Again, sir, will I be allowed to answer this question or? or it's a yes or no question. Do you think it's a legitimate pursuit of the FBI? It's not to a yes stop? or no answer. What, no, 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 no. I'm not asking how. I'm saying, as an objective, do you think it's a legitimate objective of the FBI to stop foreign interference in our elections? I think it's a legitimate objective to stop actual foreign interference. Okay. I mean, I don't know what the difference is, but that's fine. Well, I'll so I, I, the, if since I can Russia it. used social media disinformation, according to Special Counsel Mueller, I understand you may disagree with the uh, allegations to interfere in our 2016 elections, are you trying to say that the FBI had no basis to inform social media companies about efforts to potentially interfere in our, in our elections after 2016? I can tell you that I, that I read internal Twitter emails where Twitter expressly talked about the fact that the FBI couldn't possibly know more than they did about whether or not there was Russian interference, and that in fact, even they couldn't determine which accounts were actually IRA and which ones weren't. Okay, I, I understand you like to filibuster. That was not an answer to my question, uh, but I'll move on. Um, Mr. Schellenberger, in all of the emails that you reviewed, did the FBI ever direct Twitter to take down any accounts or remove any posts? Yes. They directed Twitter to, to remove them, or they said these may violate your terms and services? Yes. I think, that's a, Which? I think that's an accurate use of the word direct. They said these may, they, these yeah. may violate. You think that the same saying that yes, these I may do. violate your terms and conditions is the same as directing them to take an account down? Yeah, I mean, I think if a police officer says, All right, well, uh, that's, you broke that, the, that, you that, broke that's the law. That's very helpful. That's very helpful. I'm, I'm glad to know that you think yeah. flagging something for a private company to make a decision about what they should do is a direction. Now, Mr. Chairman, yeah. you have repeatedly said that this committee is all about protecting the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. And what's unfortunate here is that we are talking about Twitter and that we are not talking about Republican government officials around the country who are banning books. And we are not talking about... Would the Donald gentleman you? No, I will not. And we are not talking about Donald Trump jailing his former counsel to prohibit him from publishing a book that the president did not want. The former president literally jailed his enemy. And we're here talking about Twitter. Twitter. And even with Twitter, you cannot find actual evidence of any direct government censorship of any lawful speech. And when I say lawful, I mean non-criminal speech because plenty I'll of give you speech one. is non-criminal. I'll give you one. The gentleman's time to expire. I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the following email from Clark Humphrey, Executive Office of the Presidency, White House Office, January 23rd, 2021. That's the Biden administration, 4.39 a.m. Hey, folks. This goes to... Um, Twitter, hey folks, wanted to use the term Mr. Mr. He used, they used the term Mr. Mr. Goldman just used. Wanted to flag the below tweet and I'm wondering if we can get moving on the process for having it removed ASAP. Boom. That is. Could you read the below tweet? And then if we can keep an eye out for tweets that fall in this same genre, uh, genre that would be great. 
This is a tweet on ve the very issue that Mac uh, Thomas uh, can Mr. you Massey just brought. for I the fullness of the record? Can you re re uh, read the? Because I've not seen this. Can you read the tweet that it's referencing? I don't have the tweet here with me, but the oh, gentleman's shocking. point was: w Tell us. You said no time did government try to tell uh, Twitter to take that to explicitly remove something. And no, I said it explicitly says, remove lawful speech. Lawful speech. We're going to conflate. The First Amendment does not is not absolute. Twitter. This is something from Robert Kennedy Jr. But. For so the record, I, I assume that's lawful speech. It's a point speech. of order, Mr. Chair. Because if Robert you, Kennedy I, Jr. Minute, said it, that's why minute. it's lawful well, speech. Just a I'll, minute, I'll Mr. Goldman. Mr. But all I'm Mr. saying Mr. is, you Chair? said no, at no time did the government explicitly say to take a tweet down. Here we have it, right here, Mr. from the Chair? White House. They, they, did, they couldn't even wait two days. Two days into this administration, they were asked Twitter to Mr. take something Chair? down. And we will get you the underlying tweet. Thank With you. With that, I recognize the gentlelady from New if, York. If, will you place it into the record as well, sir? The underlying tweet? Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Chu, I'm, I'm an information technology professional, been doing it for the most of my life. You've been evasive in many of your answers. I'm going to talk to you in some language that maybe you'll better understand, ones and zeros, okay? Let's talk about the Citizen Lab report. This is something your team frequently mentions in hearings as a way to exonerate yourself. For example, in the limitations section, it reads, we could not examine every source code component and test in the apps in every circumstance, which means our methods could not find every security issue, privacy violation, and censorship event. So it's an incomplete assessment. The report notes that TikTok's data collection using third-party trackers was in apparent conflict with the GDPR and that multiple themes were censored by TikTok. What is shocking to me is the shared source code between TikTok in the United States and the CCP-centered Doan. The Citizen Labs report says that many of the functions and classes were identical and that the differences in behavior between TikTok in the United States and Doan in China are slight changes in hard-coded values. Incredibly, specific censorship parameters from Doan are present in TikTok, but just turned off. The authors say that for unknown reasons, the parameter var variable the, uh, itself is preserved. So while Citizen Lab may have been afraid to say the obvious conclusion, Mr. Chu, I am not, TikTok's source code is riddled with backdoors and CCP censorship devices. Here's the truth. In a million lines of code, the smallest shift from a zero to a one on just one of thousands of versions of TikTok on the market will unlock explicit CCP censorship and access to American data. Mr. Chu, as CEO of TikTok, why have you not directed your engineers to change this source code? Uh, Congressman, th thank you for the question. I, I have you directed them to change the source code? Like what we are offering in yes my fourth no. commitment? Uh, have you directed them to change that source code? Uh, Congressman, um, if you give me a bit of time to just No, I, I don't. I, it's a yes or no question. Have you directed your engineers to change that source code? I, I'm not sure I understand. Why it, are you allowing TikTok to continue to have the capacity for censorship, and yet you claim here that you don't? Let me it remind doesn't. you of something. Do you realize that making false and misleading statements to Congress is a federal crime? Yes, I do. Okay. So have you directed your engineers to change that source code? I am giving third-party access monitoring okay. by experts. And, and uh, Congressman, you, you are an expert on this. You could agree with me that no other TikTok company does source this. code is the same as Doan? What percentage? I, I can get back to you on the specifics. Okay, it's I'd appreciate yeah. that. Where was the source code for TikTok developed? Was it developed in China or in the United States? It's a global collaborative effort. Like a lot was of it code developed for a lot in, of companies. Was it developed in China? Some of it? Some of it is. Okay, at ByteDance. Can, can the, when it's compiled in the compilation process, can bytecode be manipulated? We've talked a lot about source code. What about the bytecode, the ones and zeros that actually execute on the device? That, can it give be you manipulated? Comfort? Comfort, yes. Congressman, to give you comfort, that's why we're giving third-party monitors. Yes, As an expert, I think you can agree okay. that very few companies have to do this. I've got the report here by uh, Citizen Lab. I want to read you... Uh, something from Ron Deber. Specifically, in your written testimony to Congress, you stated on page nine, 
Citizen Lab found that there was no overt data transmission by TikTok to the Chinese government and that TikTok did not contact any servers within China. You implied that Citizen Lab exonerated TikTok from any information sharing with China. Well, the director of Citizen Lab saw this and issued a statement correcting the record yesterday. And I'm quoting Ron Debert, the director of the lab. I am disappointed that TikTok executives continue citing the Citizen Lab's research in their statements to government as somehow exculpatory. I've called them out on this in the past, and it's unfortunate that I have to do it again, unquote. He goes on to say, and I quote, we even speculated about possible mechanisms through which the Chinese government might use unconventional techniques to obtain TikTok user data via pressure on ByteDance, end of quote. Mr. Chu, you sent Congress written testimony citing this lab as a support of your claim that China cannot access user data, U.S. user data. And now this lab has come out to say, we never said that. That's misleading. Mr. Chu, I hope you understand what that is. That's misleading. Mr. Chu, this is yet another instance of TikTok attempting to mislead Americans about what their technology is capable of and who has access to their information. Madam Chair, I'd like to Madam Chair, I'd like to respond to that by very Ron quickly, Ebert please. and the uh, uh, Citizens Lab into the record. Without objections. With so that, I heard. yield back. Gentleman yields back. The woman's time has expired. And yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. White House staffers are some of the most powerful people on the planet Earth. Oftentimes, they get the dispositive opinion on appointments to different positions within the federal government. They influence statements of administrative policy. They uh, initiate regulatory reform. They often have a significant voice on legislation that is considered and approved. And so, Mr. Sauer, I want to understand how many of these intensely powerful people who work in the Biden White House were involved in this effort that you've been investigating regarding the desire to shape discussions on social media? At least 20 and very likely more. And was there a ringleader of this group, someone who had pervasive and uh, repeated efforts to try to coerce social media companies to shape the truth according to the Biden White House? Deputy Assistant to the President Rob Flaherty and also Andy Slavitt. Who is Rob Flaherty? He is the, uh, I believe, the digital coordinator for the White House. His, his level is deputy assistant to the president. And what behaviors of Mr. Flaherty did you observe that you found troubling? We've seen many, many pages of emails between Mr. Flaherty and social media platforms where he relentlessly badgers them to increase the censorship of ordinary Americans' free speech on social media, and he gets results. You see the platforms agreeing to censor things that are truthful, that do not violate their policies at the behest and at the pressure of the White House. Can you give an example of that? One great example of this is the Tucker Carlson video that was going viral in April of 2021, where Mr. Flaherty and other White House officials were emailing Facebook privately, demanding that it be censored. Facebook responded, this does not violate our policies. It has not been fact-checked, but nevertheless, we are substantially de-boosting it and limiting its distribution on our platforms, even though we haven't identified anything false in it. And even though it does not, they had a positive determination that it does not violate their policies. And did you assess that Facebook took that action as a direct consequence of the badgering coming from Mr. Flaherty in the Biden White House? That is a compelling inference from the email traffic back and forth that we obtained in discovery. And, and did Mr. Flaherty ever request any reports from social media companies on specific censorship issues? Very frequently. In fact, he was demanding that again and again. His, his steady drumbeat was what he called borderline content, that the email traffic makes clear. Borderline is what they call often true content, things like 
personal anecdotes, uh, uh, opposition to vaccination expressed in terms of political opposition, things of that nature. That is what he wanted to target, and he was frequently asking for reports back. They were sending in bi-weekly crowd tangle reports to the White House. They did that through the close of our discovery period, last August in 2022. So uh, 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 there was there was a, a, an overwhelming effort to get them to, to check their homework, if you will, to get them to report back on how much censorship are you doing and is it going to meet our standards as the White House? An overwhelming effort, badgering social media companies, demanding reports from those social uh, media companies directly to someone in the White House. And as my colleagues on, on the other side of the aisle remind us, not all speech is protected. Some speech is illegal. Did you see Mr. Flaherty constrain his concern to unlawful speech or did you often see this badgering and this demand for reports from entirely lawful speech? Virtually everything. I can't remember a single instance of them going after unlawful speech. Almost Virtu all of it was after lawful speech? Virtually everything that I can recall here was lawful First Amendment protected speech that was being targeted. Uh, we heard from the witness that the Democrats brought today that these were but suggestions that of course the government should be able to make suggestions to social media companies. What would be your response to that testimony? The characterization of them as suggestions is contradicted by overwhelming evidence. Calling Flaherty, for example, Mr. Flaherty's communication suggestions is akin to saying that the earth is flat or the moon is made of green cheese. Well, and of course, if someone shared those viewpoints, that would be lawful speech, wouldn't it? You'd be allowed to say that on social media and based on the- Not US if Mr. Flaherty were in charge. <laughs> that is that is the difference. And in fact, what happened was you had a de facto suppression of many, many views, including truthful views, political organization at the behest of White House officials and other federal officials. And, and I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, that when you have these intensely powerful people with the ability to control so many things even a suggestion is coercive and problematic and worthy of the committee's review. I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his uh, five minutes. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, recognized to our country and your state and appreciate you being here today. And, and uh, you're now recognized, Senator Schmidt. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Jordan, Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett and members of the Select Subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss this important issue. The First Amendment is the beating heart of our Constitution. The First Amendment is integral to maintaining our Republican form of government and the belief that we are a country of free people, not oppressive government. The Biden administration has led the largest speech, speech censorship operation in recent American history. Since taking office, President Biden and his team have labored to suppress viewpoints with which they disagree. And in doing so, they have infringed upon the individual freedoms of millions of Americans. And no matter what your political affiliation is, government censorship should concern everyone. The Biden administration has coerced, co cajoled, and colluded with social media companies to censor disfavored speech. The Biden team has publicly threatened social media companies from removing legal protections, with, with removing legal protections, blamed social media companies for societal problems, accused social media companies of killing people, and these social media companies, some of the biggest companies in the history of the world, willingly took part in this Orwellian, vast censorship enterprise. On multiple occasions, President Biden and his team have threatened to punish so social media companies that did not sufficiently censor Biden's political opposition by revoking Section 230. Biden suggested Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg should be subject to civil liability and potential criminal prosecution for not censoring political speech. President Biden also repeatedly accused social media companies of, quote, killing people by not censoring enough disfavored speech. The Biden administration has threatened and attacked social media companies so that those social media companies would censor speech the Biden administration dislikes. Until the Missouri versus Biden lawsuit and later the Twitter files, the Biden administration's efforts to pressure and collude with social media companies was behind the scenes through meetings and emails and was unknown. On behalf of Missouri and Louisiana, I was proud to join with General Landry to sue the Biden administration for violating the First Amendment through this vast censorship enterprise. This lawsuit alleges the Biden administration, including President Biden himself and members of his team, pressured and colluded with social media giants to censor free speech 
in the name of combating so-called disinformation and misinformation, which led to the suppression and censorship of truthful information on a scale never seen before. The lawsuit provides example after example of truthful information that was censored by social media companies that were admitted at a later date to be truthful or credible, including the Hunter Biden laptop story, the COVID-19 lab leak story, theory, and the efficacy of masks. Discovery obtained by Missouri and Louisiana demonstrated the Biden administration's coordination with social media companies and collusion with nonprofits to censor speech was far more pervasive and destructive than ever known. Documents reveal multiple White House officials from the former press secretary to the digital director relentlessly pressuring social media companies to remove specific posts or accounts or expand censorship practices. The White House wanted posts censored from Fox News host Tucker Carlson, even though Facebook found that the content did not violate its policies. The White House also asked for unfavorable news to be put, quote, in context with specific talking points, along with amplification of Biden administration messaging and FAQs. Missouri and Louisiana also deposed Dr. Anthony Fauci. This deposition showed that when Dr. Fauci spoke, big tech censored. For example, Dr. Fauci was aware early in the pandemic that his agency had funded dangerous gain of function research on the coronavirus at the Wuhan lab of Institute, Wuhan Institute of Virology, but he sought to discredit and suppress the theory that COVID-19 leaked from a lab to deflect blame and avoid potential responsibility for the pandemic. In his deposition, Dr. Fauci claimed 174 times that he could not recall, including about critical details related to gain of function research and other issues associated with the lab leak theory in the government's response to the pandemic. Because of Dr. Fauci's influence, social media platforms censored the lab leak theory and other COVID-19 viewpoints that Dr. Fauci and his cabal of experts disfavored. Missouri and Louisiana also deposed the FBI agent about the Hunter Biden laptop story. This deposition and relevant documents revealed that the FBI deliberately planted false information about hack and leak operations in advance of the Hunter Biden laptop story coming out in order to deceive social media platforms into censoring the Hunter Biden laptop story. The FBI also flagged social media accounts for censorship on a monthly basis and have, es have an estimated 50% success rate in getting reported disinformation removed or censored. The M Missouri versus Biden lawsuit also obtained documents revealing that multiple federal agencies have pressured and colluded with big tech or social media companies to flag and censor large number of accounts and posts, especially related to public health and elections. The federal government has even created public-private partnerships to expand its censorship reach. Without the Missouri versus Biden lawsuit and the subsequent disclosures in the Twitter files, Americans would have never known about the Biden administration's coordination, collusion, and coercion to censor speech. President Biden and his administration may lust for its own ministry of truth, but I, along with millions of Americans, will never stop fighting for the God-given right to speak your mind, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Americans have enshrined the First Amendment in our Constitution more than 230 years ago, for good reason, and for times such as these. We cannot allow the Biden administration to infringe upon the freedoms that we cherish and that have been purchased by the sacrifice of millions of Americans. Freedom of speech is vital to our country and our people. In many ways, it's our pressure release valve. We must stop the Biden administration's threat to free speech so that America can remain the freest country in the history of the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You're a, a near cabinet, cabinet level individual. You enjoy a term and Senate confirmation. Do you feel comfortable speaking to other members, uh, either cabinet level or sub cabinet level when appropriate? 
uh, to resolve problems be within the government? Absolutely. Okay. And so uh, when the FBI uh, censored the United States government, you, would, uh, you, you wouldn't have to just take it down by uh, calling Meta or Google, would you? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following the question. Are you familiar with the official verified Russian language account of the United States uh, uh, Department of State that was taken down at your agency's request? That, that doesn't ring a bell as I sit here right now, no. Okay, well, now you have something to take back and, and look at. Okay. Because, in fact, in this bundle uh, that SBU uh, constantly was submitting to uh, various... Uh, agencies was in fact a Russian language, uh, you know, statement of of a government. Literally, you took down the free speech of the Department of State. So, yes, go ahead. You mentioned SBU. I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing, but I, I will endeavor to to provide a little more context, at least as to SBU. Yes. Um, so, uh, I believe what you may be referring to, but I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing, is that when Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, the Security Service of Ukraine, the SBU, which is a long-standing good partner of the FBI, uh, asked us for help on a whole range of things. Uh, and one of those things was to contact U.S. companies on their behalf because the Russians, the invasion, had cut off the Ukrainians' communications. And so we did pass through information from uh, the SBU to social media. Are you also familiar with the fact that President Zelensky has had to clean house at the SBU? I know there have been a number of personnel changes. Okay. Well, we'll follow up in, in, uh, with this in more detail. The, uh, the, the question I have for you is, uh, you're the premier law enforcement operation, and you're a former Department of Justice, high-ranking executive at all levels. So would you agree that the job of the FBI is criminal investigation? is criminal investigation uh, and to protect the country from national security threats, those two okay. things. So the, the idea that you take information and you have it taken down, use your authority and the, the leverage you have to have Meta, Google, uh, Facebook, or Facebook being Meta, or uh, Twitter, take down people's information uh, on things like where, where COVID came from, where do you find the national security interest in that? Where, where do you find the interest in free speech of American citizens being taken down? And I repeat, free speech of American citizens. Where, where do you have that authority? So we don't uh, ask social media companies uh, to censor information or suppress information uh, when it comes to national security threats, certainly. Uh, so what we do do is alert them when some other intelligence agency gives us information about a foreign intelligence service being behind some account, we will call social media companies' attention to that. But at the end of the day, we're very clear that it's up to the social media companies to decide whether to do something the about it or not. The suggestion of the most powerful law enforcement operation is not a suggestion. It is, in fact, effectively an order. The time, the time blacks and Caucasians. To the, the gentleman from Utah and is recognized for five minutes. And spare Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese people. That is different the than the belongs to the gentleman Thank you. from Utah. Thank you, claiming my time. Mr. Kennedy, you've had uh, s some accusations uh, thrown at you today. I'm going to ask my questions briefly and give you a chance to respond to that at the end of my time here. Ms. Wiley, if I could talk to you. Uh, and, and maybe you're busy, you know, with something else there, but uh, do you trust the government to determine what facts and views the American people should be exposed to? Uh, I, I trust that we have a process whereby we can interrogate that, what we hear and learn from that, the government, but certainly I expect the government to share Facts and information. That, that, that wasn't my question. I didn't say share facts and information. I said, do you trust the government to determine what facts and views the American people should be exposed to and which ones they should not? Uh, well, I think I'm struggling with the question because that is not the simple, facts of the case simple in Missouri. Question, simple in question. Missouri versus I'm not talking Biden, about Missouri. I'm not talking about Missouri. Hey, 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 hey. I'm not talking about Missouri. This is a very simple question. Do you trust the government to determine what facts and views the American people are exposed to? 
I am not aware of any action of the government okay, that tells the that, American public what facts they should be exposed you're to. You're not aware of that? No, I am not. Oh, my gosh. Where have you lived for the last three years? In the United States of okay, America. Okay, let me tell you. Let me ask you. China suppresses free speech. Is that a good thing? No, of course not. Iran, Mullah's air suppress free speech. Is that a good thing? No, of course Vladimir not. Vladimir Putin expresses suppresses. Is that a good thing? No, we, we all so agree can we, we should agree not suppress then, free we speech. We agree then that the government should not, government leaders should not suppress free speech. Do oh, that, agree with that? That, that's a different question. Uh, yes, it is, it is unconstitutional How for the government to pass laws that would abridge free speech. Okay. That's or, the first or, or amendment. Or not pass laws, but to create pressure that would suppress free speech. They don't. Vladimir Putin doesn't pass a law. Yes. He exerts yes. his force and influence to suppress free yes. speech. Yes, the case law says that the government cannot coerce private entities. No, and we agree that's a bad idea, don't we? Yes, and I would absolutely agree when we Donald Trump... We agree, then, the government When Donald Trump wait, wait, threatened wait, wait, social we, media companies... Hang on, with hang on, hang on, Federal regulation hang shutdown, on. that was coercion. That's not my question. Oh, I know, but I think it was consistent to here's, show that we agree. Here's my question for you. We agree the government shouldn't be responsible for restricting views that the American people are exposed to. We agree on that, right? You wouldn't answer it at first, oh, but it's clear that you do agree with that. That's because a different when, question. Okay, so to my question, do you agree with it or not? I agree that the government should not violate our Constitution. Do you agree with my question? Your question is should the government whether or determine, not the This is so no, simple. it is not so uh, no, simple No, I'm going to ask it one time, and it is so simple. A seventh grader could understand this question. Should the government be responsible for the views and the facts that the American people are exposed to? The, the problem I have is that I don't okay, know I'm of any that, facts in which the government to, tells us I'm what I'm going to say believe. that you're unable to answer a question, which for me is fairly shocking as an American citizen. Let me ask you now then, having concluded that you're unaware of suppression of free speech in the last several years, what about, for That's example... That's not actually what I said, but thank you. Do you think it was appropriate for the FBI to pressure private companies to censor and take down posts that the government disagreed with? Was that appropriate? I'll give you an example that you were unaware of. I'm glad you're aware of it now. Was that appropriate for the government to do that? Sir... The only thing that is appropriate for the government to do is what it is lawfully allowed to do, both under the Constitution and the laws of this country. Which is? <laughs> Which is to conduct its criminal investigations appropriately to our laws and to our policy. So they didn't have the ability then to go to these private companies and to say they can't. They, they, they there, can't there are instances. There explore. are instances in which, in order to protect the integrity of a criminal prosecution, they may ask. Sometimes news agencies Cer and others certainly agree withhold. with that. Was that the case yeah. here? Was uh, there any I, criminal prosecutions involved with these cases? Not that I'm aware were criminal, of. Criminal investigations are not prosecutions. Okay, criminal and investigations. And also uh, the integrity of criminal. Were there any criminal investigations regarding these uh, examples? Uh, which examples are those, sir? For example, anything regarding the Hunter Biden laptop. Well, there are lots of things that have been said in public media about Hunter Biden's laptop. There, has, there was a criminal investigation, in fact, a plea in that case. Does it bother you that 51 former intelligence officials made a determination that the Hunter Biden laptop was Russian disinformation, which they admit, by the way, they had no evidence at all that that was true. Zero evidence that that was true. Does that bother you they did that? What bothers me tremendously is that while there are a lot of things we should be talking about with regard to whether or not the government at times exceeds its authority, that includes whether or not government exceeds its authority when it tries to censor or interfere with research or research institutions where uh, any White House official um, such as Donald Trump actually threatens the full power of the federal government, including the threat to shut down social media because they put a fact the check the label the on the a gentleman tweet. Has expired. Mr. I Chairman, I have a unanimous that. consent request. The gentlelady from New York is recognized. Uh, I'd like to submit for the record a tip insight to New Jersey-based Institute of Policy and Politics poll conducted of over 1,000 adults between August 2nd and August 4th of 2022 showed that eight... In gentlelady yields back. We will now turn to five-minute question. The chair recognized the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop, for five minutes. And we will go a couple rounds here, I think, and then we, we, they have called votes, so we'll get to votes pretty quick. But the gentleman's recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to focus on the testimony the chairman made reference to and that the ranking member was so concerned with damage control that she opened her comments about it. And I'd ask uh, staff to put the uh, blow-ups on the screen as we proceed. And Ms. Morris, you can begin with number one while I'm getting my first question out. Ms. Morris, uh, in your statement, you had uh, an interesting turn of phrase. You, uh, you said that no one denies that the laptop is real. What an interesting turn of phrase, because that's exactly what Twitter was asking about the day your story appeared, and it was interacting still further with Twitter and with Facebook. Ms. Dimlo testified, here it is on the screen for those who are visual learners like me, are you familiar with the October 2020 New York Post story on Hunter Biden's laptop? I am. This is Ms. Dimlo under oath. Do you recall whether any of these social media companies you were meeting with asked you any questions about it? I do. Please proceed to the next slide. And here's how, in the same page, but it was, it was relayed to me later that somebody from Twitter, I don't recall who, I'm not sure who, somebody from Twitter essentially asked whether the laptop was real. And one of the FBI folks who was on the call did confirm that, yes, it was, before another participant jumped in and said, no further comment. Proceed to the next slide. So you said he was one example. Do you recall other social media companies? Proceed to the next slide. Ms. Dimlo says, I believe Facebook. We met with Facebook soon thereafter. Can't remember if it was the same day or within a couple of days. And they also asked. And I said, no comment. That was the, that was the decision we made in those post-meeting deliberations, which is pretty typical. It was an ongoing investigation, and we don't generally comment on ongoing investigative matters when asked. So, Ms. Morris, to your point, I think this shows one thing for sure. You, you credited Michael Schellenberger and uh, some of his reporting. One of the things that he asked in one of his uh, Twitter file stories was whether the Foreign Influence Task Force people, the FBI folks who were interfacing with the social media companies, whether they knew about the Hunter Biden laptop contents that the FBI had since December 2019. So we, now we know, right? The Foreign Influence Task Force knew it was real. And it wasn't just a few people, it was common knowledge. An analyst on that telephone call before they got their act together admitted that it was real. And then the, we also know that the social media companies wanted to know if it was real. Of course they did, because the FBI had been telling them for months to be prepared for a hack and leak operation and also to be prepared for an oper something involving Hunter Biden. Of course they wanted to know. So what do you think about the fact that the FBI, in response to Twitter, told them it was real, then they covered that up or stopped, no further comment, and to Facebook, with its billions of users, said, no comment, we're not going to tell you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know, we know that the FBI <laughs> knew that it was real. Uh, they knew it was real since not just December 2019, when, um, is, which is when the subpoena that I published is from, which was in the original story, the, the uh, thanks for the meeting with your father from Ukraine story. Um, we published the subpoena. Um, and they had already confirmed, though, which we would learn later, they had already confirmed that the laptop was real and uh, the quote, not manipulated in any way, quote, um, in, in November of uh, 2019, um, a month before they actually obtained the laptop to keep, um, which is when they, got, they gave that subpoena to John Paul Mac Isaac, the owner of uh, the Mac store where Hunter Biden forgot the laptop. Um, and, and I think that's something that gets glazed over in this reporting. I'm, I'm so familiar with it, it's nauseating, <laughs> um, which is that Jim Baker was the deputy counsel at Twitter. And if that name doesn't sound familiar, I'll, I'll remind you all who that is. He's the former deputy counsel of the FBI. Like, 
are we supposed to all sit here and pretend that he didn't know what that subpoena was when he saw it in the New York Post? I mean, let's not insult our intelligence here well, and the intelligence of the American people. Obviously, he knew what it was. Point well taken, Ms. Ms. Morris, and my time's expired, but what we have always understood in all likelihood it was true, we, yet we now have yet one more piece of evidence yep. from, the, from the folks at the FBI that they, that, 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 that they interfered, Comey interfered in 2016, was it Director Ray himself who interfered in 2020? We still need to know. Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman, you back. Gentlemen. My name is Emma Jo Morris, uh, politics editor at Breitbart. Um, I'm here today because I published a series of news stories three years ago in October of 2020 about Hunter Biden's now infamous laptop, also known as the laptop from hell, uh, which is seen as some of the most scandalous reporting of the last decade. Um, what was more scandalous than the reporting itself, though, was the fact that it exposed the unholy alliance between the intelligence community, social media platforms, and legacy media outlets. At the time, I was deputy politics editor at the New York Post, and um, my reporting showed that despite then-candidates Joe Biden's repeated and furious denials, he was apparently involved in the foreign business deals of his family. Over s several days, just weeks before Americans would vote for their next president, I revealed verified, authentic emails from the Biden Scions hard drive showing Ukrainian business partners receiving leaks from the Obama White House, I documented an off-the-books meeting between then-Vice President Biden and a Ukrainian energy executive and introduced the world to the big guy um, who got action on a deal with CEFC, China Energy Company. The Post published exactly how the material for the reporting was obtained, even identifying our sources, um, as well as a federal subpoena showing the FBI was in possession of the material the story was based on and had been since December of 2019. Um, but when the stories appeared on social media that morning, the venue where millions of Americans go to find their news and editors to get their angles, uh, within hours the reporting was censored on all major platforms on the basis of being called hacked or Russian disinformation. Um, Twitter refused to allow users to share the link to the stories, banned the links from being shared in private messages, a policy, by the way, that's used to clamp down on child porn um, and lock the post out of its verified account. Facebook said it would curb distribution and reach of the links on its platform. However, the stories were not based on hacked materials, nor were they Russian disinformation, and despite those claims appearing to come out of thin air at the time, we would eventually learn that they actually didn't come out of thin air at all. On October 19th, five days after the post began publishing, Politico ran a story headlined, Hunter Biden's story is Russian disinfo, dozens of former Intel officials say. God, I can't even say that with a straight face, you know? <laughs> Politico printed a letter completely uncritically from veteran members of the U.S. intelligence community falsely claiming that the Post Exposé has, quote, all the classic earmarks of a Russian information operation. My God. <laughs> Most notable among the signatories of that letter were Jim Clapper from former DNI, Michael Hayden, former CIA, John Brennan, former CIA. Despite having such damaged credibility following their participation in the Russia collusion conspiracy theory. A few days later, on October 22nd, when Biden appeared in the second presidential debate and was uh, confronted with the facts of the Post reporting, he said to Trump, Quote, 50 former national intelligence professionals said this, what he's accusing me of is a Russian plot. But it was not, um, and he knew that. Now, fast forward to this year, three years later. Just last spring, House investigators revealed it was a call by now Secretary of State Antony Blinken to former acting CIA Director Michael Morell that prompted the spy letter published by Politico, which bypassed agency approval processes that would have been normally applied. It is also now known that ahead of my reporting, federal agencies were priming social media companies to execute an operation to discredit it. According to internal documents released by Elon Musk upon his acquisition of Twitter, the FBI and other intelligence community members essentially directed the platform's censorship operation, in part externally by working with top management and in part internally by social media companies hiring eye-popping numbers of agency alumni. 
journalist Michael Schallenberger reported, based on documents he obtained from Musk, that during all of 2020, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies repeatedly primed Twitter executives to dismiss reports of Hunter Biden's laptop as a Russian hack and leak operation. Feds arranged for top secret security clearances to be granted to Twitter management and even had encrypted messaging networks set up, which they dubbed a virtual war room. To this day, hundreds of people from the intelligence community work at social media companies. Over the last few years, my reporting has been confirmed by virtually every mainstream news outlet, from the Washington Post to the New York Times to Politico, when the stakes were nothing, by the way, two years later. No one denies that the laptop is real, that the origin story is exactly what I told you it was in the first place. This elaborate censorship conspiracy wasn't because the information being reported on was false. It was because it was true, and it was a threat to the power centers in this country. What this relationship between the U.S. government officials and American corporations represent is, is an unprecedented push to undermine the First Amendment, the right to think, write, read, say, whatever we want. And how we respond will determine whether we see a free press as inalienable or as optional. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Mr. Sauer, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Kennedy, I want to ask you specifically about the Hunter Biden laptop story. The total blackout on all social media outlets as well as telecom, you couldn't text the link to the Hunter Biden laptop story. This specifically was a form of election interference by the U.S. government in the 2020 election. I don't know enough about it. I know that. Uh, there was censorship on that story and other stories that, uh, you know, presumably um, could have changed people's minds about the election. And we know the polling demonstrates that now. People have said they would have changed their vote had they been made aware of the Hunter Biden laptop story. Isn't that correct? I am not aware of that, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, Mr. Sauer, uh, I want to turn to you. Um, you, I, I want your reflection on this form of government censorship, specifically in the 2020 election, as a form of election interference, and what I believe is some of the, you know, most egregious political scandals that, you know, I will live through in my lifetime. Mr. Sauer, what are your reflections? I strongly agree with your characterization of that form of censorship as election interference. Uh, the evidence in our case strongly supports that. Uh, it strongly supports, and actually we have judicial findings now, that the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story was done at the instigation of federal officials in the FBI at a very high level of that organization. It was an orchestrated campaign of de deception that was anticipatory. It was planned in advance, and it was, I think, uh, consummated with the testimony that I hadn't seen before that's been put up today from Ms. Demlo uh, characterizing how, at the very end, the FBI then uh, 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 clammed up at the last minute after spending months of Seeding the record in these endless, ceaseless meetings with social media platforms about there's a hack and dump coming, it's going to involve Hunter Biden. Then when it actually came, they said, well, no comment. Our, our judge focused on that particular issue as kind of the coup de grace in this form of election interference. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. On July 4th, 2023, Independence Day, Judge Terry A. Doty of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Louisiana entered a historic injunction against the White House and other federal officials. This injunction prevents them from, quote, urging, encouraging, pressuring, or inducing in any manner the removal, deletion, suppression, or reduction of content containing protected free speech posted on social media platforms. Judge Doty's opinion contains 82 pages of detailed factual findings supported by 577 citations of the evidence, which is drawn from roughly 20,000 pages of the federal government's own emails and communications with social media platforms and six full-length depositions. In its recently filed stay motions, the government has hardly bothered to dispute any of these factual findings. The Court of Appeals has entered a, quote, temporary administrative stay of this injunction and granted expedited argument, briefing and argument on August 10th. 
Contrary to some recent suggestions, a temporary administrative stay is, quote, routine practice in the Fifth Circuit. That's a direct quote from their recent decision in N. Ray Abbott. And it does not reflect any judgment of the merits. Today, I want to offer seven observations drawn from the Louisiana opinion. First, the Louisiana court found, based on overwhelming evidence, that federal officials are the cause of the censorship of the viewpoints they disfavor. The government likes to claim that social media platforms acting on their own would apply their policies and censor all this content anyway. This is demonstrably incorrect. Again and again, the Louisiana court found that the platforms would not have suppressed this speech but for the fact that the federal officials were pushing for it. The deplatforming of Alex Berenson, the throttling of Tucker Carlson's content, the silencing of the so-called disinformation dozen, which includes Mr. Kennedy, uh, the suppression of much of the so-called borderline, which is, quote, often true content on Facebook's platforms, the censorship of the Hunter Biden laptop story, and much more. All these were suppressed because of the efforts of federal officials. Second, the scope and reach of federal censorship is staggering. As the Louisiana court repeatedly found, it affects, quotes, millions of social media posts and speakers all across America. It affects virtually every American who reads, listens, engages, or posts on social media about great disputed political and social questions that federal censors have stuck their fingers into. Third, federal censorship is ongoing and it shows no signs of relenting. Federal official censorship efforts are in full swing, and they're expanding to new frontiers. Left unchecked, federal censorship will reach virtually any disputed social and political question over which federal officials want to impose their power. Fourth, the Louisiana opinion shows that federal officials are most eager, most focused on, focused on silencing truthful speech and to muzzle the most influential critics of the administration and its policies. Tucker Carlson, Alex Berenson, and many others were targeted not because what they were saying was necessarily false, but because it was the most effective criticism of the narrative line that the administration was pushing at the time. Censorship is not about truth. It is about power, preserving and expanding the power of the censors and the political narratives they prefer. Fifth, federal officials are deeply intertwined with what other witnesses have called the censorship industrial complex. The Louisiana court made very detailed findings about the close connections between many federal officials and that mass surveillance and mass censorship enterprise that calls itself the Election Integrity Partnership and the Virality Project. <clears throat> Not just CISA officials, but White House, State Department, and Surgeon General officials have deep ties to that enterprise. As the Louisiana court found, CISA and the EIP were completely intertwined. Sixth, Federal officials don't just dictate the outcomes of specific content moderation decisions. They also directly induce changes to the content moderation policies, policies of major social media platforms to ban disfavored viewpoints in advance. And seventh, the federal censorship enterprise has succeeded in transforming online discourse by rendering entire viewpoints virtually unspeakable on social media, which is the modern public square. This ongoing distortion of the most fundamental American freedom, the right to free speech, is intolerable under the First Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sauer. Senator Holy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Um, I think it's safe to say that that all of you are here today because you are opposed to government censorship. Is that, is that right? Have I got that broadly correct? Okay, we can agree on that much. Um, book banning is a form of government censorship. Is that broadly speaking correct? Professor Knox, let me, you're, you're an expert in this. Let me just ask you. Um, book banning is a problem under the First Amendment because it's the government telling private individuals, authors, what have you, what they can and cannot write, telling the public what they can and cannot read. Is that broadly speaking correct? Yes, that's correct. So now what if, what if the books were digital only? Could the government ban them then? So no, no hard copies, no, no 
physical copies is just digital books. Could the government engage in book banning then under the First Amendment? No problem. No, that's about f a format of the particular book, and that really doesn't matter when it comes to whether or not government is banning a book. Okay, what, what, if, what if the government made a list of authors whose books it wanted banned and also went to all of the publishing houses in America, the government did, and said, do not publish the books by any of these authors or we will punish you. Is that a problem in the First Amendment? My hope is that the government would not be involved in the decisions of a private company. Good. I would hope so, too. But apparently that is not the case in the United States of America today under this administration. Because the hypotheticals I've just given you aren't hypotheticals at all. They've happened. And we know that they are happening. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals just ruled in a case, Missouri versus Biden. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. It's going to go down, I think, as a landmark case in the worst possible way in First Amendment law, because what the Court of Appeals found is that the White House, not just the federal government, but the White House actively coerced every major social media platform in America. Let me say that again. Every major social media platform in America to ban speech that the White House did not like. What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about speech on the COVID-19 pandemic, speech on the 2022 congressional elections, speech related to mask mandates, speech related to vaccines. What did the White House do? Well, over a period of years, they met with on a regular basis the leaders of social media companies and demanded that the speech they did not like be taken down. They further demanded that these same social media companies amplify the White House's speech. Amazing. So take down all of this speech that we don't like, amplify our own speech. Unbelievable. What kind of speech are we talking about? Well, for example, not just public officials, but Parents, here's an example from my state, the state of Missouri. This is, I'm reading you from the opinion here. One parent who posted on nextdoor.com, which is a site operated by Facebook, posted an online petition to encourage his school to remain mask optional, found that his posts were removed without notifying him, and his friends never saw them. Another parent in the same school district who objected to mask mandates for school children responded to Dr. Fauci on Twitter and promptly received a warning from Twitter that his account would be banned if he did not delete the tweets criticizing Dr. Fauci's approach to mask mandates. These objections, amazingly, these, this censorship was taken at the direct behest of the federal government, the direct behest of the Biden administration. Professor Knox, is this a violation of the First Amendment? Only a judge can make that determination. And a judge has. I'm glad you said that. Multiple judges. The district court, federal district court, said there was a direct First Amendment violation. Court of Appeals, unanimously, three-judge panel, unanimously said direct First Amendment violation. I can't think of another time in American history when the President of the United States, and I say that advisedly, because the record reflects that White House officials were sending emails and communications to these companies saying that the President himself wanted the censorship. So you've got the government doing exactly what Professor Knox said is not permitted under the First Amendment, directly coercing the speech of private parties, and not just one or two authors, but parents all across the country, unprecedented in the history of this nation. So I'm glad we're having this hearing today. I hope that we will have more like it to expose the censorship happening at the highest levels of our government. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that this this opinion, this judgment by the Fifth Circuit, Missouri versus Biden, be entered into the record in full. Without objection. I will leave it there. I know there are other Senator Kennedys here who want to ask questions, but I just want to say for the record that this kind of censorship is un-American, it is unconstitutional, and I hope it will go down as a sad chapter in American history that we can close here and now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Senator Kennedy. 
five minutes. Thank you. You know, when you were here in March, I commented that sunshine is the best disinfectant and that this place needs to be fumigated. We've been working hard to do that over the last seven months, but it hasn't been easy and our work continues. Mr. Schellenberger, when you last testified before our subcommittee, you responded to a question from Chairman Jordan when he asked about the Hunter Biden laptop story, and I'm going to quote what you said. You said, quote, now maybe the FBI agents were going to Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and to Twitter executives were warning about a, and were warning about a hack and leak potentially involving Hunter Biden. Maybe those guys didn't have anything to do with the guys that had the laptop. We just don't know. Well, you know what? Now we do know. And we know after interviewing Laura Demlo, who at the time of the Hunter Biden laptop story was on the Foreign Influence Task Force, she, we have learned from her that she and others on that task force did in fact know about the laptop before the New York Post story broke and they knew it was his. In other words, the work done in the year since the release of the Twitter files has continued to expose the extent of the censorship industrial complex. These discoveries show the importance of your testimony and the oversight work that has been done by this committee. What do you think this shows in terms of the complexity and scope of the censorship industrial complex? What I mean by that is even though with the trove of information that you released over a year ago or approximately a year ago, we're still filling in the gaps to understand the extent of what the federal government has engaged in in terms of violating the First Amendment. Yeah, I think what it, I mean, one of the most important things that it shows is that the censorship is in service of disinformation. It wasn't that they prevented the New York Post from publishing. It wasn't even that, that, that they did the tweet eventually did come back um, on Twitter, it was eventually allowed. But the disinformation that was planted that my, myself and all my family and friends believed was that there was something fraudulent about the Hunter Biden laptop, which we now know was actually the Hunter Biden laptop. It's been verified now by all the major media and everybody else. So, but it created the perception that it was uh, misinformation by the Russians. And of course that conspiracy theory continues to be peddled today. So that's what it did. And, and that's how these guys at CTIL thought about it. That's how all of these operatives that are used to waging disinformation campaigns and psyops in foreign countries turned those tools against the American people. And, and that that's is, the critical point. They have been yes. turned against the American people. Absolutely. Uh, what do you think about the fact that the FBI agents warning Twitter about a hack and leak were the same agents who knew that the, uh, of the existence and le legitimacy of that laptop? What do you think about those people? I, it's shock. I mean, it's I mean, I, I, like you said, I was trying to only report on what we knew at the time, but obviously when that came out, it's absolutely shocking that you would have FBI sitting on this information in 2019 and then seeding the idea that there would be a hack and leak coming. I mean, it wasn't just Aspen Institute, it was also Stanford came out and they used that as a, pre, as a pretext to attack the Pentagon Papers principle upheld by the Supreme Court that when journalists like us are leaked information, we can publish it and we're protected by the First Amendment. We saw Stanford, we saw Stanford Institute attacking that precedent and saying journalists should no longer follow the Pentagon Papers principle. They should no longer report on information leaked to them. They should not do what Matt and I and Alex just did with publishing these files, leaked to us by a patriotic whistleblower mm -hmm. who, was absolute, who knew absolutely that this was wrong, that it was a violation of the First Amendment, that it was a violation of it in the spirit and the letter. And that's the kind of, I mean, to see these institutions of the establishment argue against this great American tradition of journalism and the First Amendment, it's quite appalling. It's shocking. Shocking. Um, Ms. Sabramanya, here in the House we are exposing the U.S. government censorship by proxy, which uses social media companies, academia, and private companies to circumvent the First Amendment. At the same time, we are watching with horror as liberal democracies in Europe and Canada are not even trying to hide their efforts to center, censor their citizens. We know where this is going, and without exposure and reform, we could be doomed to the same fate. In your opening statement, you discussed the impacts of the Online News Act and the other censorship efforts seen in European nations, and you issue a stern warning that I hope all Americans will take to heart. Could you describe the trends that you are seeing and specifically what tools or mechanisms of control these governments are trying to exert over free speech? Um, thank you for that question. Um, some of the examples are from my testimony, so debanking is one obvious um, uh, tool that the Canadian government, in a sense, has pioneered as far as Western liber liberal democracies are concerned. China has been doing that for years, but it's now come to the West. 
um, and they went after peaceful protesters uh, um, uh, and, and punished them, weaponized the financial system, weaponized the government against them to teach them a lesson. Uh, you can't do this ever again. And, uh, and this sort of thing has a chilling effect on people's ability to express themselves freely. And that certainly happened in Canada. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what's happening in Ireland, again, another country that I've mentioned, what's happening in France, the EU directive on uh, online speech, um, all of these things are just extremely problematic. And what is, what, I want to say something here. What, what is under threat here is a core value of Western civilization. That's right. That is what is being undermined here. And that goes back to the Enlightenment. That is what we have to fight for. And the way you tackle misinformation, disinformation, all of these things which are um, bandied about loosely by people who want to censor you, the best solution to these things is more robust debate, and that goes back to the Enlightenment period, and that's what I want everybody to remember. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Taibbi, Mr. Schellenberger. Thank you for battling for all of us. Thank you for working so hard to protect our First Amendment rights. We really, really yeah. are terribly indebted to you, and you as well, Janine. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back suit, Mr. Manier. Well said. Uh, the chair now recognizes the ring. <laughs> We appreciate the enthusiasm. The, uh, we will now begin uh, today's hearing with opening statements. I'll start with the chair. One of the most egregious forms of the weaponization that this subcommittee has worked to expose is the coercion of social media companies by the federal government. And we wouldn't know anything that we know today. We wouldn't have learned and had the reports we've had without the work of Matt Taibbi, Michael Schellenberger, Barry Weiss, and other journalists who wrote the Twitter files and first exposed the, uh, these efforts. Their important work was first made possible because of Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter and his commitment to free speech. The path for getting this information, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the path for getting this information out has not been easy. Finding the truth never is. Instead, we were obstructed at almost every turn, and many of the people who sought to help us expose the censorship industrial complex as Mr. Taibbi and Mr. Schellenberger have, I think, appropriately label it, have been targeted. On December 10th of, of 2022, after the first Twitter files came out, Mr. Musk tweeted that Twitter is, quote, that Twitter is both a social media company and a crime scene. Three days later, three days later, the Federal Trade Commission sent Elon Musk a letter demanding to know the identity of the Twitter files authors and inundated the company with harassing requests for information, literally three days after. Name four journalists by name. And while Twitter put this information out voluntarily, the other platforms were not as forthcoming. Instead, we had to subpoena them in February of this year, fought with them for months, had to threaten contempt before getting substantive information about government's efforts to censor the American people. And when we first had Mr. Taibbi and Mr. Schellenberger testify back in March, an IRS agent showed up at Matt Taibbi's door. I mean, think about this. I, I've told this story numerous times, and there's not one person I've told this story to, not one group I've spoken to, where I say, while they are testifying, while Mr. Taibbi is testifying in front of the committee about the weaponization of government, the IRS was actually, at that very moment, knocking on his door. There's not one person who thinks that was just chance. That just happened to, you know, it was all a coincidence. Not one person, believe, everyone understands that to be the intimidation from our federal government. Now, the good news is this led to a sweeping investigation of the IRS's home visits. And the best news is the IRS has said they will no longer be making unannounced visits to American citizens' homes. It's interesting that the commissioner actually said, the commissioner actually said, we are doing this to protect for the security of our agents. Baloney, they're doing it because we caught them. And we made an issue of it. And the American people understand that that is wrong. This subcommittee's work has also included putting out reports showing how CISA went from a cybersecurity agency into the disinformation police and how the FBI coordinated with a compromised Ukrainian intelligence agency, that actually happened, to censor Americans. We were also able to expose how the other platforms were pressured to change their behavior. Documents we obtained from Facebook so that the company felt threatened by the White House directly and changed its behavior for fear of retribution. And just this morning, we released information showing the same thing happened with YouTube. 
While we have more information forthcoming, it's impossible to get a full accounting of the government's censorship efforts when the government actors involved will not participate with our constitutional duty to do oversight. That's why today we are serving subpoenas to former White House employees Rob Flaherty and Andy Slavitt, who have so far refused to sit for interviews despite being directly implicated in emails between the White House and tech companies. I think we might have brought this out in the, in the previous hearing with um, some of our witnesses today. But never forget, the third day of the Biden administration, I think it was maybe may like 36 hours into it, Andy Slavitt sends an email from the White House to Twitter saying, take down this tweet ASAP. And of course, the irony was the tweet was about, the tweet was from this administration's Democrat primary opponent, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And there was nothing in the tweet that was false, and yet the White House, day three, the Biden administration is trying to take that down. So we've sent subpoenas to those two individuals and hope that we will have them in front of our committee real soon. I wanna thank our witnesses for appearing before us today and helping us to continue our work in exposing government censorship, in exposing what two of our witnesses have called, as I said earlier, the censorship industrial complex, this marriage of big government, big tech, and as we found out with some of our work, big academia involved in attacking American citizens' First Amendment liberties. We appreciate you all being here. We will introduce you here in a, few, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes, but I now yield to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, for the life of me, I cannot find anywhere in the public notices, in our meeting memos, in our congressional hearing documents, any mention of where this is a hearing about President Trump. I, it, it escapes me. I, I know that we have a literacy crisis in this country, and I am shocked that it has made its way to the halls of Congress. I think we should do something about that. Anyways, I speak for all Americans, I believe, when I say that it really shouldn't matter who's in office. It really shouldn't matter who is in the White House. Because regardless, we should all be concerned about our constitutional rights. We should all be here protecting our constitutional rights. And so I would encourage my Democratic colleagues that they maybe they should, I don't know, focus on the evidence that has been presented here because it impacts all Americans, not just Republicans, but Democrats too. So I, I think that we could actually do something to address the weaponization of government in a bipartisan fashion because it has tremendous impacts on our everyday life. So I'm gonna just jump right into it. Ms. Troy, I appreciate you being here. My colleague, Mr. Bishop, touched on this, but I wanna just make sure that I am exceptionally clear. You said that, quote, the government is not taking social media posts down, end quote. This is from your opening statement. You said that the censorship of American people is, quote, the result of the social media companies exercising their First Amendment rights. You were part of Vice President uh, Pence's team, were you not? Yes, that is correct. And so as someone who is familiar with White House officials, you can confirm that the Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Digital Strategy, Rob Flattery, and the White House Senior Advisor, Andrew Slavitt, are indeed government officials and not social media executives, correct? Yes, when they were serving in, their, in the White House, they are government officials. Okay, so on February 6, 2021, at 9.45 p.m., I just love when we have timestamps and all this in writing. It helps tremendously. When Mr. Flattery emailed Twitter executives demanding the immediate removal of accounts linked to Biden's adult daughter, he stated, please remove this account immediately. He also stated, quote, I have tried to use your form three times. It won't work. I think this is ridiculous that I need to upload my ID to prove that I am an authorized representative of the president. Two minutes later, at 9.47 p.m., Twitter executives responded saying, thanks for sending this over. We'll escalate for further review here. He shot back. I cannot stress the degree to which this needs to be resolved immediately. Those accounts were then suspended and taken down. Now, fast forward about a month, Mr. Slavitt. Biden's White House senior advisor said in writing, you know, it would be nice to establish trust with Twitter executives. Internally, we have been considering what our options are on what to do about non-compliance. Is that a threat? Would you consider that a threat from Biden White House officials to social media company executives to censor Americans' First Amendment rights? I think you would have to ask that question to them. I can't speak for what was intended by that message. If you were in that position, what would you do? Well, 
Actually, I can tell you because I've had conversations with social media companies during the Trump administration while on Mike Pence's office where I did call a social media company and we did uh, say, could you please take these photos down if possible because a US missionary was killed brutally in Cameroon. Yeah. And Charles Wesco from Indiana, whose brother serves as a Republican in the end, Indiana state legislature, it was his brother who was killed brutally. And the ambassador from Cameroon, US ambassador, did weigh in and say, can we take these down while they circulate to notify the next of, next of kin before they see these horrific images of their father brutally murdered in a crossfire between two different opposing groups in Cameroon. Absolutely, Ms. Troy, that is, that is heartbreaking. Them. And well, hold on, I've got to reclaim my images. time here. But so Ms. Troy, what answer? I'm saying is, Can I, I just presented, no ma'am, I presented you with a parody account that the White House had to take down, a parody. That is a very different situation than graphic photos of a tragedy. Would I you am, agree? I am speaking That's a simple yes or no. a situation where Ms. Troy, if you, cannot, if you cannot distinguish between a parody account and memes and jokes versus graphic photos, that's a problem. I can't speak to what they were referencing. I don't know. I just laid it out for you, but I, I'll reclaim my time. I'm going to switch to you, Mr. Schellenberger, Mr. Taibbi. Thank you guys for appearing here before. In a very short order, I have to go... Uh, appear before the CDC director, Dr. Cohen, please talk about the treasure trove of evidence that you have found with regard to the CDC silencing world-renowned epidemiologists such as Dr. J. Bhattacharya and the impact that that has had on public health and the health of various Americans around the country because of the work of the CDC and FDA silencing these voices. Time of the gentlewoman has expired, but the, that the witnesses can respond and answer Thank the you. question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, uh, during a crisis, you need free speech so you can respond, you can have these issues, you can debate them. And what we saw was both Harvard epidemiologist uh, Martin Kildoff um, and Stanford epidemiologist Jay Bhattacharya were both censored. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya was put on a trends blacklist. The things that they were advocating was mainstream epidemiology um, and their voices were stifled. And we now have seen the consequences of it, most particularly this horrendous learning loss among children that could have been avoided if we had adopted uh, what Dr. Bhattacharya was recommending. Mr. Tebbe, go ahead. Just quickly, if I could, yeah, the, sure. the, the trans blacklist uh, image that we saw with Dr. Bhattacharya, that was one of the very first things that we found uh, in the Twitter files. And it was a, uh, an early example of what, um, what we came to understand as malinformation. Uh, it's the idea of something that's not untrue or it is true, but uh, is believed to produce an undesirable uh, political result. Um, this is extremely dangerous. Dr. Bhattacharya has had a legitimate scientific opinion. He turned out to be correct. Uh, his study was later ra uh, ratified by the WHO. Um, and, but it, it was considered to be um, against the policies of the current government. And so he became one of the most suppressed people in the country during 2020 and 21, which is exactly what the First Amendment was designed to prevent. I would just point out before rec uh, recognizing Mr. Goldman uh, that we will take you up on what you said, Ms. Troy. Ms. Kamek asked you a question and, and about Mr. Slavitt and Mr. Uh, Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Stefanik, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has been almost one year since the first bombshell Twitter files. Looking back now, and my questions are for Mr. Taibbi and Mr. Schellenberger, what was the most alarming thing that you came across during your review of internal Twitter documents? And I have a number of follow-up questions, so keep it short. Sure. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I think the most alarming thing that we, we saw was the regular stream, uh, organized stream of communication between uh, the FBI, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and the largest tech companies in the country. Uh, they had an organized system for flagging content, uh, not occasionally, but in enormous numbers uh, involving spreadsheets of accounts that ran to the hundreds and thousands. Um, and this was shocking to us and uh, to the congressman's point. This isn't crazy conspiracy theory. We've already had four federal judges uh, rule that they believe this, violate, this activity violates the First Amendment. 
Uh, this is quite serious. We didn't know whether it was against the law, but we certainly thought it was shocking uh, enough to be in the public interest. And that, for me, was the most serious thing. Yeah, for me, it was seeing the uh, so-called former FBI officials within Twitter uh, and working with and other groups, including this Aspen Institute, participate in an effort to so-called pre-bunk the Hunter Biden laptop before it was ever published in the New York Post, and then to get it censored uh, by Twitter in violation of Twitter's own terms of service, whose internal staff had concluded that the New York Post tweet had not violated their terms of service, and they censored it anyway. Mr. Schellenberg, I want to ask you further that revolving door between the FBI and Twitter, and I also want to ask about those third-party, essentially government proxies. You referenced the Aspen Institute. Can you delve deeper into both of those questions, both of those topics? Sure. It was the former general counsel of the FBI, Jim Baker, and the former uh, deputy director of the FBI had both taken jobs at Twitter. There were so many FBI people uh, at uh, Twitter that they had their own internal group um, and their own little uh, crib sheet to describe the, the difference between the terms that they use at the FBI versus at Twitter. CIA um, had it as well. Yeah, CIA as well had their own little internal group. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the, the second question? The third party proxies. Oh like yeah, the well Aspen then the Aspen Institute, this was the weirdest thing. We discovered that Aspen Institute had created a workshop that it was attended by basically all of the major media, including as well as all the major social media platforms to basically pre-bunk in advance the Hunter Biden laptop, even though it had not been, there was no evidence that, 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 it, that, that it existed outside of the fact that the FBI knew that it, they had it because they got it in December 2019. So to have the Aspen Institute trying to persuade people not to cover the Hunter Biden laptop story in August and September of, of uh, 2020 was quite uh, chilling and disturbing to see. Um, these content moderators at social media platforms like Twitter wield an enormous amount of power in terms of determining not only what Americans can say, but also what Americans can see. Do you believe, Mr. Taibbi and Mr. Schellenberg, that it's appropriate for unelected bureaucrats or these tech companies to collude to influence what Americans can say or read? Absolutely not. And, you know, I wanted to stress again that all this was happening secretively with the blessing of the Department of Homeland Security, with them sending uh, things to, uh, from this is from the EIP at Stanford to, uh, you know, to, to Twitter and Facebook saying, we repeat our recommendations that this account be suspended. We recommend labeling all instances of this article. We recommend that you flag as false this. All these demands being made secretly without any, any public review. My view is that we don't, uh, the government doesn't decide who can speak in the, in the town square. Why should the government be deciding who can speak on social media platforms? We the people should decide our own content as adults, legal content, it should not be decided by either government or big tech. And Mr. Tybee and Mr. Schellenberg, do you believe that this censorship is a form of election interference? I, absolutely it is, there's no question in my mind. Mr. Taibbi? Yes, I think it, it certainly can be. Um, in the latest story that we uh, did on the CTI League, uh, we saw the overt partisanship of the people involved in this uh, or operation. That was actually the reason the whistleblower came forward. Uh, the people involved, just assumed, one of the quote was, they assumed every, everyone who was smart thought the way they did. Um, they talked about the potential election of Donald Trump being an end of the world event. Um, they talk about the wackadoodles who actually watch Fox, Fox News. Um, and, you know, even as someone who doesn't vote for Republicans, it was shocking to me to see this. And I think this was a consistent theme of, of uh, not just the CTI League, but most of the censorship organizations that we looked at. They all tend to drift in one direction. Yield back. General Lady yields back. Let me ask you about some of the disturbing allegations that have come out of special counsel Jack Smith's political crusade against President Trump. And we've seen a heavily redacted search warrant. Here you go with the first page. Here you've got a page that's in print, another in print, another in print, attachment B in print, all about the subject account page three that I'm going to come back to in a minute, and then look at the rest. Redactions, redactions, redacted, fully redacted, fully redacted, fully redacted, there and there. So that's very helpful 
when things are so heavily redacted you can't get to the information. Now, Tennesseans are very concerned about two tiers of justice and weaponizing of the government. But what we see from this search warrant, and here it is on page, let me go to page two first. That gives you what they're getting from the subject account, which is Trump's account. You're going to see that on page one and page two, and the information that is there. They're wanting to get at his Twitter account, everybody that had access to it and all the information. Well, then when you go to page three, they are going to subpoena all data and information that is associated with this, and anybody that reposted information on this that favorited or retweeted post by the account, as well as all tweets that include the username associated, all synced, all contacts, and this covers October 2020 to January 2021. Are you aware of this? I've seen some of the media reporting about it, but obviously this is a matter that's being led this? by this. Well, again, this is a, an ongoing investigation being led by a special counsel, and there are uh, all kinds of court restrictions that apply. Somebody approved a search warrant for everybody that was retweeting or reposting from the Ayatollah's account? Have they gone to his account prior to October 7th and looked at that? This is such an invasion of free speech. And as we talk with you about social media and what is going on with social media, we're concerned about this. You know, if I liked a tweet from President Trump, if anybody on this side of the dais retweeted a tweet from President Trump, according to this, Jack Smith could go pull everything affiliated with our Twitter account. If anything that came from that real Donald Trump showed up in our feed, do you think that this is an infringement of my free speech? Well, let me say this. I certainly understand the concern, but I, what I would I tell would you is, so. but what I would tell you is that uh, this investigation being led by the special counsel is not appropriate for me to comment on that ongoing investigation. It's also under the supervision of a court, which. Includes Ongoing the, includes investigation the yes. is code word for we are stonewalling. It, and we hear this from you all repeatedly, and it's really quite frustrating. No, ma'am, and, and I understand why it's frustrating, uh, but that policy about not commenting on ongoing investigations is one that goes back decades. Uh, Republican and Democratic administrations, it's yeah, not something that's just invented. These investigations are not coming to completion. Thank you, Mr. Senator. Uh, Blackburn, before you leave, I want to make a point for the record, since I understand you made some statements about the Jeffrey Epstein flight logs. There's a Fox reporter in the hallway who asked me about this, and I said, I had not spoken to you one time about this issue. I think you'll back me up on that. I'm not, not mistaken. I didn't know that this was even a subject of your amendments, which, if you recall, you were the first on the list until the two-hour rule was invoked. Uh, I don't know anything about this request on your part. I'll be happy to discuss it with you. But I haven't done any discussion with you to this point, correct? Mr. Chairman, I know, and I think you're fully aware that I had two amendments, I one wasn't. dealing with Epstein and Sotomayor. I brought it up previously. <laughs> we have such an issue in this nation with the sex traffic and human trafficking rings that have proliferated across this country, and it is damaging the lives of women and girls. We have got to step up and help them. Getting to the bottom of what happened with this Jeffrey Epstein case is going to be an important thing to do. And it should be at the top of this committee's to-do list as we fight some of this proliferation of CSAM. There were 122 amendments, I believe, filed. I did not know that you would have 177. Gentlemen, yields back in the chair's discretion. We'll do another round of questioning for the witnesses, so I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Harrington. Mr. Chairman, if I might, um, 
perhaps the chair could do a question, another round of questions. I, you don't it, care to? If I, I do have some time constraints. No one, I, no one, no I, one I has to stay. No I, one has to stay, and we're not going to be long. But I'm, I've got another five minutes. And you yes, don't sir. Have to stay. Yeah, no objection to that. No objection to that. All right, good. Thanks, sir. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's in, at the election of every, every member whether they have further questions they want to ask. And so the chair will ask five minutes of questioning. If you'll restore my time to five minutes, please. Um, Ms. Harrington, you, you've referenced a number of times uh, that CISA operates a rumor control website where you correct things you've identified that are misinformation. Uh, you understand from uh, the prior testimony and the questions of members no one has an objection to CISA having a website uh, publishing what it contends are corrections of uh, rumors that are false, right? You understand that? Yes. You, you, do you understand what the committee uh, is concerned about in terms of CISA's prior conduct? Or do you find, are, you, are you unaware of the subject matter that we're concerned about? I, aware, I, I am aware. I'm aware of what you're concerned about, um, censorship, essentially. I'm aware of that. Okay. Has, and, and do I understand your testimony previously be that CISA really hasn't changed its policies to, to uh, avoid censoring? Representative, respectfully, we, we don't censor. Okay. I, I can Did tell you, you what we are doing. Okay. No, hold on a second. So do you know what switchboarding is? I am uh, was re was made familiar with that okay. recently. Did? I was not at the agency when that. Okay, um, I'm really talking about CISA. Not really talking about specific to your career. Obviously, you're here as a representative of CISA. Did CISA switchboard? Yes, but please okay. allow me to is? explain what I understand that. Well, I just want to know what because I, I understand we may get lost in exactly what switchboarding kind of in includes. But you you have a notion in your mind of what it is. Is CISA continuing to switchboard? CISA is not switchboarding. CISA is not sending emails on behalf of election officials from both parties to social media companies. Okay. That is not when, happening. When did CISA stop switchboarding? My understanding, although it predates me, is that CISA stopped after the 20 cycle. Why did it stop? Representative, respectfully, again, this predates me, but my understanding is that CISA makes decisions to prioritize efforts based on where the most impact is and to align resources with priorities, and that was an agency decision. Again, that predates me, but my understanding is it stopped and it is no longer happening now, and it stopped in the 20 cycle. See, my concern is if CISA sw stopped switchboarding because it thought switchboarding was a questionable practice or one that was exceedingly disapproved of, then that might uh, satisfy me more. But what I understand you're saying is it's simply a resource allocation uh, or a prioritization determination. So you could resume switchboarding next week if you want to. Is that what you think? Representative, respectfully, I understand that was an agency decision. Again, it predates me, and that activity is not occurring. Yeah, but that's not what I asked you. I asked you whether you believe it to be true that CISA could resume switchboarding next week. Representative, again, switchboarding is not occurring, and that stopped in the 20 cycle. Forwarding emails to social media, a limited number of emails from both parties to social media companies is in that not case, happening. It, you would agree with me, would you not, that there's no reason that Congress shouldn't restrict CISA's authority to make sure that it does not, it cannot switchboard, since you're not doing it, right? Representative, we are not censoring. So we can provide that in law, make sure that that's a clear guardrail, correct? It, representative, respectfully, it's already in law. Is, oh, really? That we shouldn't censor, it's the First Amendment. But you shouldn't name. switchboard. I agree. I mean, that, that you've kind of hit the nail on the head with that. We are not statement. censoring. Because the problem it is... It doesn't censor. The problem is whether switchboarding is censoring. And I think you just conflated the two, which is exactly the problem. Let me ask this question. Is CISA meeting on a regular basis with social media platforms? CISA does not meet with social media platforms. You said does not. Did it meet with social media platforms on a periodic basis? I, re I understand that it was meeting with them at a time, yes. Monthly and then weekly, 
during the run up to the 2020 elections, correct? I am not certain on completely what that cadence is. Okay, I'll represent to you that that's what it was since you don't know, but you should. They met with them monthly and then weekly leading up to the 2020 elections. Are those sorts of periodic meetings with social media companies still going on? Representative, SZA is not meeting with social media companies. Why did you stop? I understand that that activity stopped in October of 2022. Why? At, because the staff were communicating information to um, um, interagency partners as well as social media companies on basic 101 election information, and it was not good use of their time given uh, other priorities that would yield an impact. All right. My five minutes of questioning the second round have expired. Mr. Ivey, you don't have further questions? No. All right. In that case, um, I thank these witnesses for your valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we would ask the witnesses to respond to those in writing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days. Without objection, this committee stands adjourned. Subcommittee stands